We're so glad you could come. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great time for us to get together and, and have a chat. Uh, we've been busy chatting the last few days. Uh, Walter came in Wednesday night and we had three meetings on Thursday. And, uh, and then yesterday we got up and went to Nebraska and had a, had a meeting with the folks up in Nebraska and had a, had a great time up there and got home last night. And, and here we are one more time uh, to share with you folks in, in this Wichita area and beyond. Uh, we're, we're so grateful that you can be here. As I mentioned before, I'm Rick Justin, the senior pastor here. I also wear the hat of the president of the Great Plains uh, United Methodist for Renewal. And so in light of that hat, uh, you know, I care deeply about our church. I care deeply about our annual conference. I care deeply about the churches that are in our annual conference, not only in this conference, but in the conference, uh, conferences throughout the nation as well as the conferences throughout the world because we're a worldwide church, all right? And uh, I don't know if you happen to know, but uh, we're in a little bit of a crisis. And um, Walter's going to talk a little bit more about that here shortly. But uh, right, right before he does, I just want a little bit of housekeeping things. Um, there are, you know, this is very informal. So, you know, I know how not, not all of us are 25 anymore. So if you have to get up, <laughs> there are restrooms uh, over here, women's and men's here, farther down the end of, of the hallway, there's restrooms. And then clear on the other end, there's some youth having an event down there as well. There's some larger restrooms there. I mean, so you can go all over and there'll be a break time where you'll have some coffee there. You You've seen that, and uh, we'll, have, we'll have a time for that. But uh, I've invited Walter and I, we've been on the phone. He and I have been friends for some time. Uh, we first met in the late 90s at, in Lake June, Alaska, in North Carolina, at a meeting there that was called the Epworth Institute that was put on by the Confessing Movement at the time. And uh, it was a, to bring, at the time, younger pastors uh, together and, and have conversation about uh, where we were and, and, you know, to really talk about theology and, and the theology of the church and, and how it is that we minister within the life of our church and so forth. And so uh, we, we've had a relationship for some time and even more so lately uh, as uh, he's been involved with Good News, as you, many of you know, and now is, uh, is involved with the Wesleyan Covenant Association. And in conversation recently... Um, he said, you know, we're trying to get out in our annual conferences to, to share a little bit more about who we are because you can be sure there's lots of people who will be glad to tell you who the WCA is and that might not always be uh, correct information. I mean, if it's on the internet, it must be true, right? <laughs> uh, but be that as it may, um, we, at first I thought he was wanting to come during our annual conference session. I thought, oh man, that's all I need is another headache right now. And, uh, <laughs> But no, he wanted to just come into the annual conference and, and to speak. And so that's what we're doing this week. He's, he's, he's here, he's there, he's here, he's there. He, pray for him because, I mean, he just had some knee surgery. And, you know, uh, he is married, but he doesn't get to see her too often. He'd like to go home and see his wife and those kind of things. And, and anyway, so, so we were able to work this out and have these meetings and, and to, to share. And so this morning he's going to share uh, some, some of the 101 kind of basic of how it is that we've got, gotten to this point. There'll be some question and answers. There'll be a break time. We want you to know we'll have a break. And, and then there'll be more specific Q&A time on the WCA piece of it and, and so forth. But, you know, the reality is uh, before we get going, I think it would, to use one of my words, as you all know, it would what? It would behoove. It would behoove us to pray. So join me, if you will. <clears throat> God, we, uh, we come before you on this day, and we thank you, Lord, that we've had a time uh, in song to worship you, and, and just the great song, that last one especially, wow, on Christ alone, and that we stand on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. And, and God, we, we know, we're not, we're not trying to say that we own the corner of the market on theology or any of that kind of stuff. We, we just want to love you and your church and, and be obedient in the process. And, and God, we know there's just some stuff before us. And uh, we're trying to be faithful, and I know other folks are too, but yet, yet we find some, some areas that maybe we just don't, aren't always on the same page. And I pray, God, that, that even on this day that, that we'd be mindful, Lord, that uh, we are to place ourselves at the foot of the cross and to know that uh, you're going to guide us and to lead us to submit ourselves to the work of the Holy Spirit through this time. And, and Lord, that, uh, that you would guide us and direct us and, and give us some wisdom and discernment. We're not going to have all sorts of answers necessarily today, but uh, we, we do want to be uh, transparent in, in the fact that uh, we want to be witnesses for you. 
And so help us this morning. Uh, be with Walter as he shares with us. And be with each one of us, Lord, that we might hear from you and hear clearly. Uh, let it be so, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to introduce Walter Fenton here with us, and so welcome him, will you? We're That work? Well, good morning on this beautiful day in Kansas. Uh, it is gorgeous out there, and so I thank you for coming. Uh, Rick has been telling me that it hasn't been so gorgeous, and he's started to think of me as a lucky charm. Yesterday, he kept rubbing my head, and so. But anyway, I'm I'm grateful to be here, and good to good to see all of you. Uh, I want to say uh, another interesting thing. We were driving up to uh, Nebraska. About I think we took five hours to get up there. We took our time. And uh, I have to get out and walk around on my little knee. And uh, so, so we had a long time to chat on the way up and the way back. And the, the ironic thing was, is I did most of the talking. I'm sure if you did, you know, a calculation of the words, I probably had 75 to 80 percent of them. But the funny thing was, is Rick lost his voice. So I was like, this is great. I can just keep going. So anyway, uh, but he got it back. Praise the, praise the Lord. Uh, well, I want to say a special thanks to my, my brother and friend, uh, Rick Just. We, we have had a... Uh, uh, an ex uh, extended relationship. We don't get to see each other very often, but we are we have become uh, very close friends, and I just uh, treasure his friendship, honor his ministry here at Asbury, and indeed throughout the entire Great Plains Annual Conference, his leadership. Thank him for that, and um, he's recognized across the connection as one of the leaders uh, in the, the conservative evangelical orthodox movement in the wing of the church. And so we just thank Rick very much and appreciate him very much. I want to greet you uh, on behalf of the president of the Wesley Covenant Association, the Reverend Keith Boyette. Keith would have loved to have been here today. Typically we travel together, but he's at uh, a meeting uh, in Chicago today and can't be, be with us. Uh, Keith and I have spent more time with one another than we have with our spouses since <laughs> <laughs> January and uh, we we get along just fine but uh, it's not good to have more meals with your work colleague rather than your wife we've discovered and both ad ad admit as much as we like one another uh, as Rick said we are not 25 anymore and so I find that I need these little things and I'm finding right now I can't see my uh, outline here so the other folks I want to thank I really want to thank the the people here at Asbury United Methodist Church. I pastored three churches, and I know when you do things on Saturday, it really puts uh, stress on those who take care of the facilities, uh, who do all the planning and make everything happen and make us all feel so welcome and comfortable when we're here. But there's a team of people we all know who, and you got another event going on with youth down the building. And so there's gonna be a team of people that's gonna have to be here for all afternoon, probably trying to clean the place up and turn it around so that we can worship and praise God tomorrow. So I want to thank the people of Asbury for hosting us here today and just appreciate them so much for, for all I'm doing and thank them very much. And finally, I want to say a word of thanks to all of you. Your very presence here today is indicative of your concern for the church. And uh, as Rick said, we're going to talk about some difficult things. Uh, I'm not going to try and whistle by the graveyard. I think we have to be real sometimes. And, um, and so I just so appreciate you taking the time to come out because you love the church and you want the best for the church. And uh, it's just I'm very grateful that you're willing to take the time to do this and to take the message back to your local church. Appreciate it. Well, I'm going to uh, just give you a little bit of the uh, outline of how we're going to do things this morning so you kind of know the, the, the schedule here. We're, um, I'm going to spend some time defining where the United Methodist Church is at right now and how it got here. Some of you are well aware of it. Some of you are not. Uh, as, as my brother Rick said, it's just a fact. Everybody now acknowledges it in the leadership of the United Methodist Church. The church is in the midst of a crisis. And one of the questions that we get asked all the time, Walter, how did it come to this? How, how did we get here? 
And, um, and, and so I think it's important that we're all on the same page of how we got here. So for the first session, I'm gonna spend a lot of time just setting the stage. I know some of you will be familiar with that. I ask you to be patient uh, because I think it's important. Everybody, every United Methodist Church member, whether laity or clergy, has a right to know how we got here. And, uh, and we, we need to set that before we move forward. And we'll have a little bit of Q&A time after that, and uh, then we'll take a break. We'll come back, and I will talk to you about the how and the why of the Wesleyan Covenant Association, and talk a little bit about the plans that the Wesley Covenant Association has between now and the called General Conference. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Uh, that will take place in the United Methodist Church in late February of 2019. And then I'll talk a little bit about potential plans of the Wesley Covenant Association on the other side of the called General Conference. So I just kind of wanted to get that outline out of the way. And then I just want to take a, a personal note, a few minutes to uh, some of you don't know me from Adam, and like, who's this guy getting up here talking about the church? So I, I, I want to spend a little time. I, I just decided this morning, I, I kind of want to just share my testimony. And, and then, frankly, hearing all the praise music, it made me even more want to share my testimony and testify to my Lord and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ. When I was a little boy, my family didn't attend church. I was one of eight children. I was the seventh of eight children. The six siblings that were older than me were, the, I was the closest one in age, was like six, seven years. And, but my younger brother was just a year younger than, than myself. And so they treated us like twins, and we were, we were the little kids. And um, uh, on Sunday mornings, what, what my brother and I, Jody, did is we would get up Sunday morning. Everybody else would be asleep. My two oldest brothers were off in the Navy during the Vietnam War, and uh, they'd all be asleep, and we'd, we'd get downstairs, and we'd grab a couple garbage bags. This is in the early 70s, and some of you out there might remember, I don't remember any girls doing beer can collecting, but some of you guys may have been beer can collectors, trying to get a nice extensive beer can collection. You'd set them on a shelf and everything. <laughs> and, <laughs> I'd never tasted beer in my life at 10 or 12, but I, I loved collecting the cans. And, uh, and so my, my younger brother and I, we, we, we discovered that if you got out early on Sunday morning and climbed up in the dumpsters behind the taverns around our town, our town had a lot of taverns, actually. We had a lot of churches and a lot of taverns, interestingly enough, but you'll have to think about that one yourself. Um, so we would, we would climb up in the dumpsters and start going through and say, boy, I hope some person last night at this tavern bought you know, some, not, not bush, we had plenty of bush beer cans. I, you know, something exotic, you know, we, we wanted, you know, a Pabst Blue Ribbon Special or something like that. We were looking for a special can, you know, that we didn't have in the collection yet. And so we would do that, you know, Sunday, Sunday morning. Well, I had a dear aunt, Aunt Kay was her name, and one of the things she did is she and another woman, they'd drive around, they, were, they were, went to the Church of the Nazarene, and they'd drive around town in a van and, and they'd pick kids up on Sunday morning and take them to church. And I remember one Saturday evening, my mom set my brother Jody and I down, and she looked at us on Saturday night and said, you know, tomorrow your Aunt Kay is going to come by in a van and pick you up and take you to church. Or she actually, what she said, she, she's going to take you to Sunday school and church. And for me, two words that just don't go together very well, in my opinion, is Sunday and school. But, uh, you know, there you have it. So we were like, wow, this is going to be a different experience, and uh, we weren't really prepared for it, and, uh, but nevertheless, she got us up early in the morning, cleaned us all up, and sure enough, my Aunt Kay came by in a van, and we climbed on board with a bunch of other little kids. And uh, at first, we just didn't know what to do at, at, at church, but you know, those people loved us. They, they cared for us, they looked out for us, and that was the beginning of my journey in the faith and in time I gave my life to the Lord and was saved and so I just so much appreciate that just, just that one story uh, reminds me of how faithful people are clergy and lay people how faithful they can be how caring and compassionate they are about the church how hopeful they are despite the challenges they just never give up they just keep persevering in the faith and so I just thank them uh, so much, and I just wanted to, to share that. I, I want to also confess that I'm a sinner in need of God's redeeming. 
Uh, we have difficult issues to discuss this morning, so I need to acknowledge that I stand in the need of the transforming power of the cross of Jesus Christ, just like everyone else. Well, it is indeed uncertain and trying times in the United Methodist Church. Uh, to one extent or another, I think everyone is aware of the debate in the church right now. The debate is superficially, or I shouldn't say superficially, on the surface there's a big debate that's been going, going on for a long time in the church over the church's sexual ethics, its teachings on marriage, and its ordination standards. And uh, at the 2016 General Conference, uh, the, the gen, our General Conference delegates, I'll say a little bit more about General Conference in a little bit, our General Conference delegates recognize that it is, this is such a crisis in the church that they empowered our Council of Bishops to create what is called a commission on a way forward with the hope that the commission could propose a solution to the crisis that all of the leadership in the United Methodist Church recognizes that we're in. Um, and so we, we, every four years, United Methodists have what we call our General Conference. It is the highest body in the United Methodist Church. It's the only body that can speak authoritatively for the church. It's composed right now of 864 delegates. Uh, and if you divided that in half, what would we have? 431. 431 clergy delegates, 431 laity delegates, okay? I think 432 is what I should have said. Uh, so we have, those are our delegates who go to the general conference. They are o elected in an openly fair process. And the general conference delegates, as I said, empowered the Council of Bishops to create the commission on a way forward to hopefully propose a solution. So we have this crisis that, uh, that we're, we're trying to work on and, 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 and solve, and then we, we have really another crisis going on that you don't hear nearly as much talked about in, in the church, but believe me, the leadership of the denomination are very well aware of the crisis, um, and if you know the right people, they will talk about it, and they are very concerned about it, and that is a demographic crisis at work in the church. And I won't give you a lot of statistics, I'll just share with you some. And they have to do with average worship attendance. Uh, we have a body in the United Methodist Church, official body called the General Council on Finance and Administration. It's their job to kind of um, to collect the, the, the gifts and the tithes that people generously give to the church, to the general church, to distribute those. They also, another one of their tasks is to keep all of the data on the church, membership and worship attendance. Sunday school attendance, how many women are attending United Methodist Women. So they, they keep all of that data uh, for us. And um, I'll, I'll just, one of the, the, the most important numbers that they watch is average worship attendance. The GCFA is also responsible for working up a budget, a, a general budget for the United Methodist Church. And so one of the key numbers that they're interested in is average worship attendance because they have discovered over the years that attendance actually has an effect on how much money gets put in the offering plate every Sunday. You can have all the members you want in a local church. I remember my first appointment, you know, it, it, I, I looked and it said in the book I was going to become the pastor at the first church. I thought they were kind of crazy to give me a church that had 250 members, but that's what it said in the book. 200, wow, I was I thinking pretty good of myself. Here, I'm, I'm going to go pastor a church of 250 members. And I got there the first Sunday and uh, they were averaging about 41 every Sunday. So we had a lot of members, not so much in attendance. Uh, and, 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 and yet, those are the people, you know, the people who show up on Sunday are the ones who, who, who fund, fund the church. So the GCFA watches that number very closely. And here's an interesting statistic. In the 16 years prior to 2001, average worship attendance in local churches in local churches in the U.S., local United Methodist churches in the U.S., that figure barely budged. So in 1985, there were 3.494 million people on any given Sunday at worship in local United Methodist churches in the United States. And in 2000, there were 3,488,000 people in worship. And so 
it ticked down. We lost about 6,000 in average worship attendance on any given Sunday. But that's not even, that's like, that's like a fraction of 1%. From 1985 to, to 2000, uh, we, we lost just a fraction of, of 1% in worship attendance. Now, in the first 16 years of the new century, average worship attendance in the local UM churches has plunged dramatically. In 2001, average worship attendance was 3.547 million. In 2016, it had dropped to 2.65 million. That's for a loss of almost 900,000. Not 6,000 as the previous 16 years, 900,000 people in average worship attendance on any given Sunday in the United Methodist Church. That's a whopping 25% worship attendance loss. And much of that loss came between 2012 and 2016 when we lost 10.5% in, in average worship attendance in just four years. 311,500 people gone from United Methodist Churches. Um, the percentage rate for average worship attendance, it's just climbed precipitously every year in the last several years. And uh, we are on course once the GCFA has all of the data and has audited the data for the past year, 2017, we're, we're on a trajectory to have lost over one million members, one million people in worship attendance in just the first 17 years of this new conference. As one denominational official said to me, they, they, they haven't published this, but he's told it to me privately in a face-to-face in a -face meeting when I was doing an interview with him. He said, you know, Walter, just quite frankly, those numbers are catastrophic. Uh, we simply will come apart as a denomination if we continue down this trajectory. They're unsustainable numbers. So we don't have time to explore all of the ramifications of these plunging figures, but I can assure you that they ripple out across the entire church and in one way or another impact all of us. They impact local churches, of course, districts. Districts start having to merge together. Uh, we, we, we do incredible things to district superintendents. We tell them, you know, instead of uh, being responsible for overseeing 58 local churches, we're going to merge a couple districts and you're going to be the district superintendent now of about 110 local churches. And that's just, un, un, it's just unreasonable. I don't know how any district superintendent adequately supervises that many local churches. Then we even annual conferences have to merge together and a number of our annual conferences have had to merge already in, in the new century and more are planning to merge um, in, in just this coming year. It also in, affects our colleges and seminaries and I think the worst thing that it does is it undermines one of the goals that the United Methodist Church has set for itself and that is to attract faithful and gifted young people into the ministry. And we have some dynamic young people, praise be to God, who really do want to serve. They're passionate. They're not looking to make a ton of money. They just want to serve Jesus and grow a church. But, you know, many of them are, are married. They went to college. The average college debt that a student graduates from college now is $26,000. Let's say a young female pastor, she has a spouse and her spouse went to college, maybe they met at college, and so he's got $26,500 in debt. She's gone to seminary to get a seminary degree, maybe she's uh, accumulated a little more debt during her master's degree program, and so now she's close to $40,000 in debt, and maybe her, her husband has incurred more. And, and then they've, they've got a, a couple kids, and they, as passionate as they are to want to serve, they, they need to know that they'll have at least a, a base salary that they can provide for their family. Even more important than the money, they, 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 they need some assurance they got some health care uh, so they can take care of their kids. And, and you know, that some money would be starting to be accumulating towards, towards a pension so that they can retire um, with a decent, decent amount of money. And so our young people eventually start to do the calculations and they sit down and talk with the district superintendents and some of them realize, wow, you know, there's really not a place for me. They can't find a place to send me where I have some assurance I'm going to have a decent amount of money to live on and take care of my kids, okay? So they're passionate. They want to serve, but we, we just can't find folks for them. And if we continue to shrink like that, it will be even harder to attract uh, young people uh, into the church. 
So it is, it is very fair to say, and why I'm spending time on, on this issue of clarifying the crisis, is there are some people in our church who, who want to, uh, to, to tell us that, well, you know, people say we're in a crisis. You know, maybe that organization, Good News, they've kind of manufactured a crisis. It's to their benefit. Uh, or maybe that group called Reconciling Ministries Network, they've manufactured the crisis because it's to their benefit. Friends, that is just simply not true. This crisis is not manufactured. Both of these crises over our sexual ethics, uh, our teachings on marriage and our ordination standards, and our demographic crisis are real, and everybody in the leadership of the United Methodist Church recognizes that we are in the midst of a crisis. So, the big question is, well, how did it come to this? I cannot tell you how many times I get asked that, asked that question. Walter, how, how, how did we get here? Well, I tell you, part of the, the, the answer to that question requires um, a, a little tutorial, a quick tutorial on what we call our church's polity or our governance structure. We, we typically use the word polity. Uh, all the clergy out there who've, who've gone through and got elders' orders or your commission or course of study, you, you know that word polity. You even have to take a class in seminary called polity. Uh, and polity is just a word that is from the Greek word polis. And the Greek word for polis, that was just simply their word for a city. So, you know, uh, but, but the term polis took on much more meaning over its life. It, it actually not only meant city, it meant the governance of the city, how it works together, how, how people do things. And so it's, it's not surprising that, like, the word politics comes from polis. And so we as a church have a polity. And so I always like to tell people, uh, we don't get to decide whether we're going to, to have church politics or not. That's not a luxury we have. The choice we have is are we going to have good and fair and open politics or are we going to have bad politics? That's, that's the only choices we have. Because since we have a polity, we are definitely going to have politics in the church. It's just the way it is here below on this side of the veil, okay? Um, and uh, so I, I want to spend a little time talking about that governance because I was raised in the free Methodist church. I was saved in the Nazarene church. My whole family actually started coming back to the Lord and my dad took us all to a free Methodist church. I was raised in the free Methodist church, but uh, in seminary I was more and more attracted to the United Methodist church. And it was really a conscience decision. It wasn't like so much emotional decision as just really a thoughtful decision. I, I really liked the polity of the church. I thought its doctrine was wonderful. I really didn't see why Free Methodist and, and United Methodist were, were still apart. They came apart just prior to the, this nation's civil war, but to me it was time for, for them to get back together because quite honestly, if there weren't names on some of the Free Methodist churches and United Methodist churches, if there wasn't a sign out front saying which was which, you wouldn't know some Sunday morning if you were in a Free Methodist church or a United Methodist church. And so I was very attracted to the United Methodist church. It was a conscious decision. I'm going to join the United Methodist church. I think the doctrine is beautiful, and I think the polity is about as good as you can, can get. Okay, And so I, I, I joined the United Methodist church when I was um, in, in divinity school. And, uh, but every church has to ask itself, uh, how are we as a church going to discern God's will for the church? That's just a fundamental decision you, you, you have to ask. And, and, and it's, it's a very difficult question. You, you, a lot of thinking has to go into it because, especially if you're a global church, and we are, we're, we're one of those kind of special denominations in, 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 the, in, the, in the United States that's part of a global church. So when we get together for our general conference, it's not just, well, the United Methodist Church in the United States gets together and makes decisions. No, we have a good number and a growing number of brothers and sisters from many countries in Africa who are part of the United Methodist Church, as a global church, somewhere between 30 to 35 percent of the delegates at General Conference are from countries in Africa. About 4 percent of them are from the Philippines, a very healthy, vibrant, growing church in the Philippines. And then we have 
uh, uh, right around 1%, a little less than 1% of our delegates represent churches in Europe and even into to, to Russia. So here we are, a very global church, and we have to ask ourselves that question. How are we going to discern God's will for, for our church? And uh, we kind of have a, uh, first I would like to say, a, a conceptual idea that we've used for many years that frankly goes back to John Wesley. And John Wesley would say, well, it all wasn't my idea for sure. He'd point his back way back to the early church and said, this, this, I think, is basically how the church has gone about trying to discern God's will. And so just let me share with you, I know many of you have, have heard this over the years, but I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. And I'd like you to think, uh, I, I like to have a model in my head when I talk about the way we try to discern God's will, and I always like to think of a pyramid. Some people think of a square when we talk about it, and that gets you in all kinds of trouble, and we have recognized that. Uh, so think of a pyramid. So we, we have like four things that we turn to as we as a church try to discern God's will. And the foundation of that pyramid, and you better have a firm foundation for a pyramid, right? And so the foundation of that pyramid is God's holy word, scripture, the Bible, okay? That's the number one fundamental resource totally in conformity with John Wesley. Uh, if you read any of Wesley's writings, matter of fact, even though he wasn't, <laughs> he, would, he would say, I'm a man of one book. And, and what he was saying is, that's my foundational resource. Wesley was widely read. He was a scholar who graduated from Oxford and taught there. Uh, he, he read very widely, but scripture was his foundational source. But there's other ways that we, can, that we are, are uh, privileged to discern God's will. And one way, sort of on, that, on one side of that pyramid, would be the traditions of the church. And when Wesley talked about the traditions of the church, he just didn't mean the traditions of the church of which he was a part of, which was the Anglican church in the 18th century. Uh, he meant the church Catholic or the church universal. So Wesley was very conversant. He was essentially a church historian or a historian of church theology. He knew very well the writings of the Eastern Church Fathers and the Western Church Fathers, loved their writings. He liked to read how they interpreted the Bible because that helped him interpret the Bible as well. And here we are, 2,000, almost 2,000 years removed from the beginning of the church. And I often think how fortunate and how blessed we are to have this treasure trove of wonderful writings, beautiful stories, challenges that the church went through. I'm always reminding myself, Walter, the challenge we're in the middle of, yes, it's a crisis. We, we have to recognize that. But the church has been through far more difficult challenges and crises than the one that we find ourselves in the midst of right now. It's just our crisis today. We need to deal with it. But so, so here we have this great treasure house of resources that we can call upon to try and discern God's will. So the church makes a big deal out of calling upon tradition to help us to discern God's will. Another side of that pyramid is our reason, humankind's ability to reason and rationalize. And frankly, this goes all the way back to the first chapter of Genesis. You know, we, we are created in the image of God. I mean, that's just you'll never have time enough to think about what that means. Uh, it's just amazing. Uh, we are created in the image of God, particularly in our ability to think and rationalize and even be creators like God. Uh, that's amazing. <laughs> and, and so we better use that great gift that God gave to us. He gave it to us for a reason, <laughs> and we're to use that reason, okay? And so we, we use that as a source to discern God's will. And finally, Wesley is known throughout church history for having added an element. It used to be those were just the three. If you go back and read St. Augustine way back in the 4th and early 5th century, St. Augustine talked about those three already. And he was relying on other uh, Christians before him. And Wesley fully acknowledged that. But one of the things Wesley also talked about that he was really known for is he said, you know, we can also call upon experience to discern God's will for, for our, our lives and for the church. 
Now, what he meant by that was, I think, something very different than sometimes what gets portrayed in the modern period. Uh, sometimes people think that what Wesley meant was my experience, just my experience. And um, I, I, I think there is some truism that uh, since the, the mid-60s, there's been a kind of a therapeutic movement in the church. Matter of fact, a lot of pastors kind of almost preach therapeutic sermons. And I'm not saying they're bad all the time, but you can spend too much time sort of navel-gazing, looking at yourself and thinking about your experiences. And Wesley, that's not exactly what he really had in mind. What he was talking about, and he used this great word that I wish we would bring back and use more often, but we, we don't. It's, it's a word from the 18th century. He would talk about the vivifying. The vivifying, our best way of translating is with two words, the life-giving experience and power of the Holy Spirit in, in our lives as followers of Jesus, and even more importantly, the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit at work in the church. Okay, so that's, that's what he meant by experience. Not just, you know, your experiences, you know, what you did last week or something like that. That's the, the, the experience that he's talking about. The life-giving power of the Holy Spirit at work in the lives of, of Christian individuals and the church as a whole. So, that's, that's kind of the conceptual framework that, that we have for trying to discern God's will. Fine, beautiful, I think, wonderful. But of course, how does that work out in practicality? <laughs> you know, when the rubber hits the road, when we really say, hey, uh, we, we have to discern, we have to come up with an answer for a problem that the church is facing, how do we take those things and apply them in any given situation? Well, here's, here's what, we, what we do. Um, the, the Methodist movement, for, when we were first founded in 1784, we were called the Methodist Episcopal Church. Wesley was a little bewildered by the American colonist and that whole revolution thing, but nevertheless he had to live with it uh, and realize, wow, they, they, they really can't be part of the Anglican Church anymore because the head of the Anglican Church is the monarch, uh, the reigning monarch of, of, of England. And they just told the reigning monarch to goodbye. <laughs> and so, so Wesley realized they, they can't be part of the Anglican Church anymore. He was still Anglican himself. He died an Anglican. Uh, and so he sent over uh, Francis Asbury and Thomas Coke. And so we, we began to, to come into to existence in 1784. And so we were called the Methodist Episcopal Church. And we were very small at the, at the time. There were other Protestant denominations much larger than the, the, the Methodist movement. But by the middle of the, of, the, uh, of the 19th century, the Methodist Episcopal Church is the largest Protestant denomination, indeed the largest denomination, Christian denomination, in the nation. Because of the, the, the influx of Southern and Eastern Europeans really happened in the latter part of the 19th century. And with uh, the, the immigration from Eastern Europe and Southern Europe, then the, the Roman Catholic Church began to become the, the largest church in the, United, in, in the United States. But at the time, it was uh, the Methodist Episcopal Church. And so it shouldn't surprise any of us that, that as our church governance began to take on shape, it looked a lot uh, very similar, not identical, but quite similar to the way the government was organized. So, you know, the government has a legislative branch called Congress. We have general conference. That's, that's our legislative branch of the church. Uh, the, the, the government of the United States has an executive branch, the presidency, and all of that that goes underneath of it. We have the Council of Bishops, okay? That's, that's our executive branch. They're responsible for executing the teachings and the, um, the, the rules of our, of our society together, of our church together, okay? And then, of course, we have a judicial branch. It's called the Judicial Council. Some people just refer to it as, as our Supreme Court, okay? And so, so we have those branches, and we use those branches to try to discern God's will, particularly the General Conference. And, uh, and, and so, so, so we use those conceptual ideas I talk about through these various branches um, of the church. And I want to spend a little, just a quick little time here talking about the general conference. Uh, some people, uh, I, this is so, so, so sweet. Last week we were down in central Texas and um, a, a lay person got up and, and she said, I'm just a lay person. 
And I said, you know, uh, I had a prof in college who banned the word just in front of some words. <laughs> I'll be preaching here tomorrow. I'm not even sure you're going to be here tomorrow. So. <laughs> Uh, so, so he banned the word just, and, and so I said, you know, let's be honest, any, any clergy who's really honest with him or herself, it, it, the church doesn't happen without the laity. So n nobody's just a lay person. And her, her question was, well, who, who elects these delegates? You know, how, how long do they get to serve? You know, how, how's this all happen? And it was a great question. And, uh, and so here's how we do it. It's a very fair and open process. For every ordained elder or commissioned pastor you have at your local church, two laity are going to represent you at your annual conference. And if you'd like to be an annual conference delegate, I'd encourage you to get in touch with Pastor Rick and say, I'd like my name in the hopper. You know, it may, it may mean an election. You might have to run against another layperson in order to, to, to be a delegate, but you're entitled. It's, and, and then there would be a free and open election in your church as to who the lay delegate's going to be. And, uh, and so uh, at annual conference, every four years, the annual conference elects a number of delegates from its annual conference to represent the annual conference at the general conference. And so uh, there, each annual conference is, is, is apportioned a number of delegates based on their size. Okay, And then they have what are to be, sometimes they're not unfortunately, but they're supposed to be very fair and open elections. And, and so let's say, how many dele delegates do General Conference Great Plains can Conference have right now? Well, we had the combination. Right. So we had the two, four, six, plus mm -hmm. the alternates and, and so forth. But just the General Conference delegates, yeah, how many? That's so we would have six. Six. six the, and then, right, Dixie? What's your General Conference delegation, Dixie? Yeah, 12. 12. Okay, yeah, yeah. 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 Right, right. So uh, your annual conference has been apportioned by the General General Conference, 12 delegates to go represent you at General Conference every four years. And what happens is at annual conference, you're going to elect, the, the lay delegates are going to elect six lay people, Dixie's one of those, and you're going to elect uh, six clergy delegates to represent you at the, at the General Conference. And you also elect some delegates, uh, uh, some alternates as well. Say someone gets sick, can't make it to the General Conference. And so these are, are supposed to be very fair, open elections. And, uh, and so, frankly, see that th right here, this is, this is something that was attracting me to the, to the United Methodist Church, the this, this sense of fairness and, 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 and prayer that, that almost before you, every ballot at General Conference, in every annual conference I've been to, they stop and pray before they cast the, their ballots, okay? And so this happens all around the world. So when the 864 delegates get there, there's an equivalent number of clergy and laity to represent them. And we, we re-vote every year. It's, you don't get to be elected for life as a delegate. You, you know, if you, yeah, maybe you got to go to the general conference in 2016 as a lay delegate, but you'll have to stand for election again in 2019 if you're going to go to the 2020 uh, general conference delegate. And so it's at general conference where we try and put those conceptual ideas into practice for discerning God's will as the general conference delegates contend with a number of petitions. Friends, over 1,000 petitions were submitted to the general conference in 2016. Okay, uh, some people, I've, I've heard good clergy say, oh, general conference is just a, a big junket for, for, for you know, higher up, uppity, uppity clergy and laity who happen to get elected to general conference. I have been to a number of general conferences and observed many general conferences. I can tell you it is not a junket. Uh, it's anything but a junket, particularly for laity, because many of them, they will literally take vacation time so that they can go to the general conference. And by the end, it lasts seven, 10 days. And by the end, I look in their eyes, they are physically, emotionally, and spiritually exhausted. They're up very early in the morning and go to bed very late at night. I would say on average, most of our delegates are getting somewhere between four and six hours of sleep 
during general conference. They are just exhausted and talking about very emotional things. Because the goal is to get through all of those petitions. So they first have to, to, to divide up in a bunch of leg legislative sections, and then they will try and take up the legislation as a full, full plenary session. The, the full body gets together and tries to take these up. And what they're trying to do is take those conceptual ideas and apply them to any given issue before them. And by the way, these petitions, they come from all over the church. Every one of you are entitled, if you are a member of the United Methodist Church, are entitled to submit a petition to the United Methodist Church. It's a very pro fair process. And, and here below, since no one of us knows the mind of God completely, we try to work together to discern the mind of God. It's the best way we know how on this side of the veil, as I like to say, okay? And so, another thing I really don't like that people accuse uh, general conference delegates of is being mean-spirited and argumentative. They just get to general conference and they're just arguing with one another. That's not true. That's simply not true. There may be people attending the general conference to observe it who might be mean-spirited and call each other names. By and large, I have observed many sessions, legislative sections, and full gatherings of all 860, 864 delegates, and they try very hard, even though the, the, the issues are very emotional, they try very hard to be gracious to one another and civil with one another as the, they debate these issues. And then after a time of open debate, it just has to come down to this. They vote. They say a prayer and they vote. And so we use this very, very fair process to get our delegates, very, very fair process so that people can submit petitions. And then we have all vowed that since the General Conference is the highest legislative body, that what they approve, I had to stand up and at an annual conference, Rick did, many of you sitting here had to, and you, you vow that you will follow the teachings. Not only will you follow them as a pastor, you will promote them and teach them. That, that's what you vow to do. And, and am, I, am I thrilled about every exact thing the United Methodist Church does? Of course not, no one of us is. But I, I can try and change it if I want to. But once my, once, once my, my, my proposed change is heard, if it's accepted, fine. If it's not, I, I have to be a part of the team and say, I will follow. I made a vow that I would follow the teachings of the church. And frankly, all of you who are members of the United Methodist Church took membership vows. And essentially, you vowed to do the same thing, okay? Maybe the vows were a little bit different, but by and large, they're pretty much identical. So that's how we, we, we do this, this process, and I am so appreciative um, of it. And so now I want to talk more specifically about general conference, okay? And, and the issue that's before us of, of our church's sexual ethics, uh, our uh, teachings on marriage, and our ordination standards. The issue first came up in 1972. The church never, the Methodist Episcopal Church, the Methodist Church, these are just other iterations of our name over, over our history, never had any teachings. We had sexual ethics, to be sure. Every church has to have sexual ethics. Jesus taught us some sexual ethics himself, uh, and of course there's sexual ethics in the Old Testament. And every church has boundaries with regards to do with, with our human sexuality. We all praise God for the good gift of human sexuality. It's a great gift. But like so many gifts, they, they have to have boundaries to them, or we will get ourselves in no end of trouble. We all know that, you know? And um, we don't, maybe we don't want to talk about it, but we all know we, we will get ourselves into trouble without boundaries. And so, uh, so one issue that our church had never publicly had, an, had a statement on was the issue of practice of homosexuality. And there were some folks in 1972 wanting to, to liberalize our sexual ethics and, and have a statement that, that allowed for uh, practicing homosexuals to be members of the church and things like this. And so the, the, the conference had to take it up. This is 1972. I, I, I was, you know, I was only 10 then, but I'm smart enough to remember this is a, this is a topic you just, nobody hardly talked about at all in, in polite society. You just didn't talk about the issue of the practice of homosexuality. But here are churches, and I'm, I'm grateful. I'm, I'm, I'm like um, impressed that way back in 1972, our church on the floor of General Conference had by and large a gracious, open, candid, 
conversation about the practice of homosexuality. And did they come up with some mean-spirited statement? Did they just look at, at say, the, the two references to the practice of homosexuality in Leviticus chapter 18 and Leviticus chapter 20 and said, that's good enough for us, we'll just take those passages where the practice of homosexuality is called an abomination? Did they take that passage and look at No, they didn't. They looked at all of Scripture. And they came up with a, a, what I think is a gracious statement, particularly for the time and place. They said, this is what we believe, that all God's people are people of God and are deserving of respect and of God's love. They are precious children just as much as all the rest of us are. But we as a church find the practice of homosexuality incompatible with Christian teaching. And there you can kind of see the conceptual ideas working out. They, they just didn't say it's incompatible with Scripture, incompatible with Christian teaching, which includes the Bible, the traditions of the church, reason, and the vivifying power of the Holy Spirit at work in the church. That's how they came to that conclusion. And so th that was our statement in 1972. And so for a number of years, we can continue to every general conference. This issue would come up again and again every four years. And in some ways, I, I think it was a very necessary and healthy conversation that we would have over and over again. Let's be honest here. Uh, many of us grew up in homes. My mom and dad never sat down and talked to me, gave me the little birds and bees lecture. They just kind of hoped I would learn it, which is kind of silly, uh, because you know who I learned it from was my friends in high school. That's a disaster. Uh, and, and, and now, uh, of course, we have so many ways, so many forms of media, and I just fear for, for children today. Uh, if we in the church don't talk about sexual ethics with our young people, boy, we have just run the white flag up the pole, and we will reap the whirlwind, and we are reaping the whirlwind for not having done our jobs by talking to our young people and helping them have a healthy understanding of our sexual ethics that will help them, will help them in their marriages, will help them in their adult lives. And so I think that for a long time, the debate we had in the church was necessary and healthy. It, it went on for a number of years, but then around 2000, uh, the year 2000, uh, the debate started to just turn acrimonious and not very helpful. In, in, at the 2000 General Conference in Cleveland, uh, two of our bishops, 28 lay people and, and clergy, were, had to be arrested by the Cleveland Cl Police Department because they were trying to disrupt and bring the General Conference to a halt. And so literally, some of our bishops had to call the Cleveland Police Department to come in and remove, actually they were taken down to the police uh, municipal building, uh, so, so they were, were arrested. We arrested two bishops and 28 laity and clergy so that we can move forward in the conference. Um, in 2004, we were in Pittsburgh for General Conference. We, we celebrate Holy Communion almost every day at General Conference. And during one of the times of Holy Communion, it was not long after the, the, the General Conference had revisited once again all of the issues, took the votes, and said, no, we're going to reaffirm our teachings, our sexual ethics teachings on marriage and worship nation standards. One district superintendent was so angry that the church did this that when he came up to receive Holy Communion, took the, the bread that was given to him, but instead of dipping it into the chalice, took the cup from the, the co-celebrant and smashed the chalice on the floor of General Conference. When, when it gets to that, you know as a church, you're kind of in trouble. Uh, things are not becoming a civil debate anymore. They're becoming very acrimonious. In Fort Worth, Texas in 2008, a number after votes were taken once again, a number of protesters just crossed what's called the bar of General Conference. Dixie can be inside of the bar of General Conference because she's a properly elected delegate. I can't be. I'm, I'm not an, an elected general conference delegate. I can sit and observe, but I have no voice. I can't stand up and say something. There's a representative my, from my annual conference to speak for me, and I'm to stay off of the floor of the general conference. That year in Fort Worth, a number of people just rushed onto the floor, crossed the bar of the annual conference. They had a black shroud with them. They went up to the communion table and draped a black shroud 
over the, uh, the Holy Communion table and, and brought the proceedings of General Conference to, to a halt. It took us two or three hours. The bishop said, we don't want to have to arrest people ever again. It's just such a black eye to the church to have some people in the church arresting other people in the United Methodist Church and that getting in the papers. So they didn't arrest them, but they had to negotiate for two or three hours before they would leave the bar. General conference is very, very expensive, my friends. It costs us about 10 to $12 million to put on a general conference. We're flying people from Africa, the Philippines, all over. And so it's a very expensive endeavor. And here they brought the whole thing uh, to a halt. In 2012, the same thing happened again, brought the conference to, to, to a halt. But then a new strategy on the other side of 2012 was adopted that really was the one that led us to the crisis that we're in today. After 2012, uh, progressives, uh, ardent, uh, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered, queer um, community uh, adopted a new strategy. Their strategy, I think your former bishop, Bishop Scott Jones, put the best name on it. They adopted a strategy of ecclesial defiance. They started to say, well, we don't care what general conference decides on these, on these matters of our sexual ethics teachings on marriage and ordination. We're going to do what we think is right rather than what the church says is right. And so many of you, of course, have heard uh, or probably read, uh, we have had pastors preside at same-sex marriages. All clergy know that that is a chargeable offense. You can be brought up on complaints. You can be brought to church trial. And it's quite possible you may have your credentials removed and no longer be appointed to you. You will no longer be a pastor in the United Methodist Church. But a number of clergy went ahead and do that. We even had a bishop uh, do that. A retired bishop presided at a same-sex service. Uh, so these kind of incidents went on and on. In some places, the pastors who did this, their bishops did not really make any attempt whatsoever to hold them accountable. Okay, And, um, and then, of course, at 2016, uh, we had the, the, the delegates saying, this is becoming such a crisis. Bishops, we're empowering you to appoint a commission to hopefully bring this issue to, to a, a close and we can get a, a good solution. And so what they decided to do as part of that, there was a compromise that any petition at the 2016 General Conference having to do with the church's sexual ethics, its teachings on marriage, and its ordination standards, we'd just table them. We weren't going to take them up at the 2016 General Conference, which meant that our Book of Discipline, as it is written, would remain in force. And there was kind of an understanding that let's all, whatever side you're on on these issues, let's all just take a deep breath. The bishops are going to appoint a commission, uh, and then we're going to have a call general conference. And in just like one or two years, in 2018 or 2019, they in, in, ended up landing on 2019, and, and we will allow that call general conference to hopefully bring a global solution to this acrimonious and bitter debate that's been going on now for a long time, and hopefully resolve it. So let's not do nothing, whatever side we're on, let's, let's be careful here. Well, unfortunately, literally just weeks after the, the general conference, uh, many of the annual conferences just to continued to defy the teachings of the church. A bishop in the New York annual conference, she, she, um, she openly ordained a self-avowed practicing homosexual who was in a same-sex marriage. The Board of Ordained Ministry recommended, enthusiastically recommended that candidate. She ordained him. So here we're kind of supposed to be holding, but in, instead they did it. And then most egregiously, and many of you are aware of this because you're in the South Central jurisdiction. The South Central jurisdiction played a key role in this. Uh, the Western jurisdiction uh, defiantly, provocatively, knowingly, wittingly elected a, a, a pastor from uh, Glide Memorial United Methodist Church in San Francisco who was well known to be in a same-sex marriage with another woman, actually a deaconess in the United Methodist Church. Uh, and that she had, in an interview with the New York Times uh, some years ago, had, had admitted that she had presided at at least 50, she kind of lost count, she said, but it's somewhere around approximately 50 same-sex weddings, <laughs> all in, in defiance of the teachings of the United Methodist Church. But nevertheless, the delegates in the Western jurisdiction uh, elected her. And that really sent the church into to, to crisis mode. I won't go into all of the details of what happened after that. 
But uh, so here we are. We're, I say that we're, we're really in a constitutional crisis because the legislative branch of our church has spoken. We, they've established and reestablished and reaffirmed our sexual ethics, our teachings on marriage, and our ordination standards. But some in our executive branch refuse to implement those teachings. It would be like the President of the United States and we're not going to get into politics. For the, we, we got plenty of politics in the United Methodist Church. We don't need to talk about those. But it would, it would be as if the, United, the, the, the President of the United States said, yeah, I know we got a Constitution. Now, you all seem to like it. Ah, there's parts of it I don't like. I'm going to violate the Constitution. That, that's when you have a constitutional crisis. And that's what we have in our church. We have a constitutional crisis. And, uh, and you just can't go forward very productively and very healthily uh, if you have your church in the middle of a major constitutional crisis. So that's how we got where we are. And I just wanted to make sure before I start to talk about the Wesley Covenant Association after our break and a little bit about what's going on in the church, I'm sure you'll raise questions, but I wanted to set the table so we're all on the same page together. So before we take a break, I think we have about five minutes and if anybody has questions about what I just uh, said there, I'd be glad to answer them. I do want to say now, and I'll say it again, uh, I know these are emotional issues. I, I know these are contentious. You're, you're maybe a member of a, of, of a United Methodist Church that you and your ancestors have been members of for years. Perhaps you, your, your church has a cemetery right next to the building, and your loved ones, some of your loved ones, are buried right next to the church building. And, uh, and so this is, this is a very emotional issue for you, what, what's going to come of the United Methodist Church. But I, I would encourage you, because there are some people here who have a lot of questions, and they're very good questions and legitimate questions, so uh, please refrain from speeches and, and just allow people to ask their questions, okay, so we can get those out and get those answered, because I know some of you here are like really representing your, your local congregation. You want to go back and tell people, well, this is what I learned. This is what we need to know. This is what we need to come up to speed on, okay? So if there are any questions, we'll, we'll, have, a, we'll have a much more extensive time for Q&A later on. But if, oh, this is great. We got a, a microphone here. I want everybody to hear the question. So raise your hand and, and um, I'm sorry, that's uh, Pastor, Susan. Pastor Susan will come and, and bring you the microphone so everyone can hear your question. So any, any questions right now about the presentation? And these are questions referencing these. Primarily what I just said. We'll have time to ask questions about the Wesley Covenant Association uh, in the second half. Much more time of Q&A. But if you have any questions now, that's, that's fine. Well, that's great. We are going to get a... Oh, I'm sorry. Is there a question somewhere? Yeah, uh, the gentleman back there in the, in the booth. So I'm surprised he could just turn my microphone off and take the... You <laughs> talk about the... That's a great question, a very complicated question, especially in the United States of America that has such, just within the family of, of Christians, has so many denominations. I've lost track of how many Christian denominations there are in the United States. It's, I'm sure it's in the thousands. Uh, but um, there, since the 19th century, there have been what have been referred to as the main line denominations. And, and what we were, when people use that phrase, the main line denominations, I wouldn't really call them main line denominations anymore because many of them have fallen on very hard times. And there are other churches now that are bigger than, than they are. But, but the main line denominations, really, in like the 1950s in the United States, that were well regarded, uh, had you know, millions of members, hundreds of thousands at least, if not millions of people attending on Sunday morning were churches like the United Church of Christ, the Episcopal Church, uh, the Presbyterian Church, USA, Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, um, the American Baptist Church, uh, and then the United <coughs> Methodist Church, or in the 50s we were the Methodist Church. Uh, and so people who aren't even Christians, sociologists, academics, who just think it's fascinating to follow 
the development of Christianity in the United States have done tons of research. One of the biggest firms is the, the Pew Charitable Fund that does tons of polling on uh, denominations in the United States. And um, our brothers and sisters in the mainline denomination, Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, Presbyterian Church, USA, Episcopal Church, help me hear, who am I forgetting, Rick? Um, what, what's that? American Baptist, yeah. The, these, not so much the American Baptist, but, but the other three, sir, oh, United Church of Christ. Uh, so, so Evangelical, Lutheran, Presbyterian, USA, Episcopal Church, and United Church of Christ have all been through the same debate that we're all going through for about the same number of years, by the way. But those four have, like, kind of got in some way, as painfully as possible, have in some ways got on the other side of the debate. They've had fallout. So take the Episcopal Church, for instance. Uh, not the Episcopal Church, not near as big as the United Methodist Church, but quite similar in its polity and its form of church governance to the United Methodist Church. Well, they really had a falling out in, in the first decade of the 21st century. And now a good number, a, a, a substantial number of uh, Episcopalians left the Episcopal Church and formed a new denomination called the Anglican Church of North America. And so now um, Anglican churches of North America, local churches like that, are popping up all over the country, particularly in the eastern part of the country where Episcopalianism has always been fair, fairly, fairly large. And, um, and so they're, they're on the other side of it. But as they were going through those battles, same for Presbyterians, UCC, and, and Lutherans, as they were going through those battles, they started to experience the same percentage losses that we're now seeing. And a matter of fact, the closer they got to the crisis where they in, 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 uh, finally divided, and there have been divisions in all four of these uh, denominations, the closer and closer they got to the division, the higher the, the worship attendance loss went up. They, they, they were running somewhere between five and a half to six percent uh, membership loss uh, annually. So we're, for all practical purposes, we're on that trajectory, unfortunately, right now. Whether it ever get that high over 5%, that would be a huge, huge number. Uh, we're talking, you know, a couple hundred, 250,000 people in a year if we get up to 6%. So, yes, others have experienced that and, and, and seen the same thing. Well, hey, we've reached the break. Some of us have had coffee and water and, uh, and, and need to, 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 to take a break. Oh, did you learn something from Polity 101? <laughs> All right. Well, as I was saying, uh, sometimes we, uh, we think, well, we don't need to hear that. But on the other hand, I think most of us need to hear that uh, because especially, you know, in the life of the church, it's not like we get up here as pastors for the most part and do that kind of a teaching. And that's really what it was, was some, was some teaching uh, to help us understand and, and to help us realize, um, you know, here, here's... Here's where we're at, and here's how we got here. Now, he could share way more on polity, but uh, we don't want to spend all day there. We're going we're to move into the uh, WCA piece. But um, Pastor Susan, who is our congregational care pastor here at, at Asbury, who does an awesome, by the way, awesome job for us. <clears throat> so here, here's the pat on the back. All right. <laughs> But she does wonderful work for us. But what we thought we'd like to do is, is just go ahead and pass a, a little notebook around. It, it kind of gives us a feel for, for who was here and where, what, where you, what church you represent. Uh, so we can kind of have an idea. Now, as I look out here, I mean, I can see some folks from uh, the Dodge City area. I can see, I know someone's from Johnson. I, so that's, that's four hours away. You know, we had some people in Nebraska who drove six hours yesterday for the meeting. And so... Uh, we have other folks here. I do want to welcome our, our district superintendent's wife, Nancy Reese, with us this morning. Uh, Mitch couldn't be with us but uh, because, you know, he's doing DS things. But uh, Walter and I had breakfast with him Thursday morning. So we're not doing anything that Mitch doesn't know about, all right? Uh, 
And Nancy and Mitch have been friends of Mary Lou and mine for a long time, and we're really glad to see you uh, here. And also just up there in Nebraska, we, we let the DS know that as well, and the bishop knows we're doing this, so we're not, we're not trying to hide anything. And if you come here today, I don't know everybody here, but if you are here today, and, and maybe you don't land quite where we land on, on this particular issue, uh, that's okay. In, in the sense that what I mean by that is we're glad you're here and we want you to know what we're talking about, okay? And so there's just a transparency in that as well. So uh, with that being said, uh, Walter, here we go again, brother. I want to uh, s s explain a, a few pieces of information here that you can have. I'll have these in the back. I'll try and slip into the back. Uh, we have a brochure from the Wesley Covenant Association. I'm going to be talking about the, the association in just a moment. And uh, I'd encourage you to take one of the brochures. We also have uh, contact cards. If you're interested in learning more about the Wesley Covenant Association, this is one way you can do that by just filling out this contact card. And we will sign you up so you can get any information you want. This is not a membership card. It's just uh, you saying, hey, I'd like to receive your emails and other information that you put out. And you can, you can use that. And again, the brochure will um, help you learn about the congregation. And could you put up on the screen uh, those, those two slides I, I sent with you, and I'll kind of explain those. Another way that you can, can join the Wesley Covenant Association or simply uh, sign up is if you have your cell phone, you can simply text WCA join or WCA renew if you'd like to renew your membership or join, you can do that. Uh, so that's, that's one way. And the next slide, if you'd like to, to, to get, uh, we have a, a, a video and a book uh, that's like a, a study information. A number of churches are using this resource. The book's called The Firm Foundation. A number of the chapters are written by great leaders and pastors in our church. I think, you know, of Carolyn Moore. She's pastor at Mosaic Church in Georgia. Just a, a great pastor, great homiletician for starters, and then just a wonderful local church leader that has taught pastors all over the country. She writes one of the chapters in the book, the great Maxie Dunham, who's up in his 80s now, but is as healthy as a horse and still very plugged in. Maxie was in the civil rights movement in, the, in Mississippi, was a pastor there, really put, put himself on the line, so much so on the line that he was threatened and had to move to Southern California. Um, so a great man. Maxie has a chapter in there. He was the president of um, Asbury Theological Seminary for a number of years and a number of other authors. And then there's a video that goes along with it. So this is a great resource that you can be reading in a small group, read one chapter a week. And then when you all get together, you could watch a video. The uh, video is narrated by Reverend Jessica Legrone, who Jessica is the dean of Asbury, the dean of the chapel of Asbury Theological Theological Seminary, and I know many of you are familiar with Jessica Legron. She is a wonderful preacher, and uh, we are so blessed that Jessica uh, gets to touch the lives of so many young people who are coming uh, and wanting to go to seminary and thinking about entering into ordained ministry, and she does a wonderful job of, of narrating. So thank you very much for showing those, those slides for us. And you can just text that number. You can write in foundations, and you can, uh, you can get the, the information on the book. And again, you can join, you can get out. We have an app, and with that app, we push out information weekly. If there's a development in the church, you can count on, we will get information out about it very quickly. The app's easy to get. All you have to do is, you know, go to uh, you know, like a, the Google Store or the App Store for Apple and simply type in uh, WCA app. So WCA a P P and you can download the app and if you just put the note push notifications on it'll always pop up you can make it go away real fast but it'll always have something almost every week that that you can read about what's going on in the United Methodist Church and then we just do a lot of articles that that help lay and clergy people think about core teachings of our church right now we're doing a series on grace and really exploring uh, how our great founder, John Wesley, conceived of how grace works in the lives of, of Christians. So there's that kind of resource. And then, uh, again, if there's major news in the church, we will put out uh, a piece that you can, you can read. And we have a website, uh, WCA, or WesleyCovenant.org. And you will see that in the brochure, and we'll have those in the back. And then finally, um, <clears throat> 
uh, Cokesbury, or, or Abington Press, which is the, the publishing house of the United Methodist Church, uh, reached out to the Reverend Rob Rimfro. Uh, Rob is the um, pastor of discipleship at the third largest United Methodist Church in the country, uh, the church down just north of Houston in, 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 in the Woodlands. Uh, they have a little over 13,000 members now, and average worship attendance is right at about 6,000 people every weekend. We just had our Easter services uh, this past year, and over 12,500 people attended uh, about nine services through that weekend. So Rob is very, very busy uh, as the pastor of discipleship at the Woodlands, but one of the other great things that Rob does, he can't give a whole lot of time to it, but he is willing to give some, and we're very grateful. Uh, he is the president of, of the Good News Movement, which has been around for over 50 years. And Rob played a leading role in creating the Wesley Covenant Association that I'll tell you about in, in just, just a moment. And, um, and so Abingdon Press uh, decided, they're, they're of course recognizing, fully recognize the crisis at work in the church. And so much so that they said, you know, let's do a series. They, they called the series the Fault Lines series. And they said, you know, let's, let's contact people all across the theological and social um, line in the United Methodist Church and ask some of the leaders to write a book from their perspective and we'll get these out across the church. They'd really like to see them used as study resources in small groups or Sunday schools. And so, so they asked Rob and I to write a book from an evangelical perspective and uh, we wrote a book, uh, we gave it the title, Are We Really Better Together? And so we try and take on some of the most difficult issues, whether they're of a theological nature. We have a chapter in there that I wrote on the interpretation and authority of scripture. Uh, we have a chapter in there on the mission of the church, a uh, chapter on the way forward. Rob has a chapter on the church's sexual ethics. And we just clarify the differences at work in the church. We're very candid about our own positions, but we try to dispassionately uh, explain the other side as well, okay? And so uh, if you would like to purchase this book, um, I have some in the back, and some of you already have, and I thank you very much for that, but it's for, for $15, and you can purchase it in the back. So I just wanted to get that out of the way before we uh, move on. Okay, I'm going to wake up my little iPad, and uh, we'll plow in. I see that it was perfect. It's 11 o'clock right now, and uh, this is such a beautiful day that I don't want us to go past noon, and you probably don't want us to pass noon either. So we are going to work hard to get through this. Uh, I know some of you will have some great questions. Everywhere we go, we get great questions. And uh, we'll get to that time as quickly as possible. But we'll, we'll bring things to a close at noon. I'll be around to, to answer any questions you might have afterwards. I'll be happy to stay as long as you, you want. Uh, but I, 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 don't, I know other so grateful to, to those of you who literally are driving four hours for this. Yesterday, six and a half hours. Uh, that just, that is so indicative of the passion that people have for their local church and their concern for the whole church and just want to be fully informed. And that's just so critical to where we are uh, right now. So with that, let's start to talk about why the Wesley Covenant Association? Why do we need an association like that? How did that come into existence? And so just let me very dispassionately talk about this. Um, and, and I really want to do this because unfortunately, uh, I can, in, in this day and age, unfortunately across our whole culture, and it affects the church, it infects the church, I should say, we're unfortunately given to, to, to believing, you know, conspiracy theories. And with the internet, as, as Pastor Rick said, you know, well, it must be true if it's on the internet, uh, you know, people put things out. Uh, I, I, I'm not accusing anyone of, 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 of trying to be that they're doing things for nefarious reasons. Sometimes they just think they do know how things happened and without talking to anyone else they just go ahead and say hey here I know how this organization came into existence and with all due respect some of them I read and I thought where in the world did they come up with that? Uh, because I'll just be honest I, I know from point A to where we're at now, exactly how the Wesley Covenant Association came into existence. I was part of bringing the Wesley Covenant Association into existence. And so just let me, let me tell you how, how it came into existence. 
<clears throat> for many years, going way back into the 1970s, uh, the Good News Movement uh, that I worked a number of years for uh, before I came on with Wesley Covenant Association, the Good News Movement was founded in 1967 had nothing to do, its founding had nothing to do, by the way, with the church's sexual ethics. That wasn't an issue yet. The issue in 1967 was the church's doctrines. Many Orthodox conservative evangelicals felt like that what the publishing house was publishing for Sunday school curriculum, some, some people became very worried about it, okay? Uh, and and you, you recall, we're kind of in the middle of the, of, of the 60s here. And by the way, in the 60s, practically every local Methodist church, we weren't the United Methodist Church yet, practically every Methodist church, every Sunday school, used the curriculum produced by the, United, the Methodist Publishing House. That's kind of just the way it was. I would say well over 90% of local churches used curriculum published by Cokesbury. And, um, and, and some began to have questions about that. And uh, out of that, I won't go into the long story, but out of that came the Good News Movement, okay? And, um, and Good News has been around over 50 years. Over time, the leadership of the Good News Movement thought, you know, there's a renewal, and, that, and they refer to themselves as a renewal and reform movement. Good News took its, its mission to try and renew and reform the United Methodist Church. Uh, and, uh, and, and they, they got to know of other movements going on in these mainline denominations. There's a renewal and reform movement in the, uh, in the Presbyterian church, almost as old as Good News, maybe even older than Good News, called the Presbyterian Layman. That was the name of the organization. I think it's kind of ironic. It's been led by a, a woman as the president of the, Pres of the Presbyterian Layman organization. She's a very uh, effective, uh, articulate leader. Carmen Fowler is her name. Uh, leader of the Presbyterian Movement, and it was kind of, it, it was the renewal and reform movement in the Presbyterian Church, and there was a renewal and reform movement in the Episcopal Church, and the United Church of Christ, and the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, and so we all decided, you know, it'd be good for us at least once a year to get together and see if we can learn from one another, and so I think way back in the night, late 1970s, they started to get together for a day and would share, hey, what's going on in the, uh, uh, in the Evangelical Lutheran Church and how are you all as a, a renewal and reform movement contending with that? And this just went on. Every year we'd get together and have a conversation, kind of like a day of learning from one another. Well, like I said before we ended, uh, these other denominations have kind of shaken out. Uh, some of their renewal and removements exist no more because so many of the, the churches split and uh, there really wasn't a need for the renewal and reform movement anymore. One branch of the church went one way in, in some of the denominations and others went the other way. And so at, at some point, the Good News Board, and, and Dixie, I think Dixie slipped out, but Dixie Brewster has been a member of the Good News Board for a number of years and a general conference delegate as a layperson from, from the Great Plains Annual Conference. Uh, the, the Good News Board, uh, back in, in uh, March of 2015, said, you know what would be helpful to us is let's invite some of the leaders from these groups that have already gone through what we think we might have to go through as United Methodists. So we invited Carmen Fowler from the Presbyterian Layman. She's watched. By the way, their average worship attendance, Carmen followed those numbers closely. They were bumping right up around, losing 6% annually uh, in worship attendance in Presbyterian churches across the country. They used to have over a million people uh, in worship in Presbyterian churches. Actually, you go back to the 70s, they were over 2 million members. Now they're under, they no longer have a million people in worship on Sunday. It's down around 800,000. And so, uh, so we invited Carmen. Carmen, you talked to us about how things shook out in the Presbyterian Church USA. And then we invited a gentleman by the name of uh, Bishop Clark Lowenfield. He's a bishop in what's now called the Anglican Church of North America. And we said, you come and talk to us as well. Both of them came at the same time. And it was just a great meeting. And, uh, and both of them said, boy, you don't want to get caught flat-footed. You don't really know when the big blow-up's going to come. You don't win, know when the crisis, if it's going to come, or when it's going to come. But you should be prepared. And Carmen, frankly, was quite candid. She said, you know what? We weren't prepared. I wish I had a game plan that I could tell you that we followed, uh, and I could just pass it to you, and you could follow it in case you needed it. And she said, to be quite honest, 
I'm interested to hear from Bishop Lowenfield because in my opinion as a Presbyterian, I think they got it about as good as you can get it. And, and, and so she turned to, to Bishop Lowenfield and Bishop Lowenfield said, well, I wouldn't say we got it just right. <laughs> We, we tried, but there is definitely some truth to what happened in the Presbyterian Church is those who just couldn't go along with the, the, the Presbyterian Church USA, by the way, changed its teachings on sexual ethics, changed its teachings on marriage, and changed its teachings on ordination. They liberalized all of those church teachings, and a good number of Presbyterians, clergy and lay, said, I, I'm not mad at you, I'm not angry with you, I just simply can't walk with you if that's the direction you're going, and now I have to go someplace else. And since there wasn't something ready for people, to, and churches and local people to go to, they just kind of scattered into five or six different directions. Some new denominations were created. There was the Presbyterian Church of America that was already in existence. Some of them went that direction. So they just kind of scattered. Some of them went independent completely. You know, well, we don't want to be affiliated with anybody anymore. And, uh, but but in, the, in the Episcopal Church, when it came time and they had the same situation developed, liberalized sexual ethics teachings on marriage and ordination, again, a good number of Episcopalians said, can't, can't walk with you now, we, we've got to go someplace else. But they had an organization all ready to stand up, by and large. Was it perfect? No. Did it need a lot of tweaks and things like that? Of course. And, and so very quickly, <clears throat> they stood up a church called the Anglican Church of North America, and it is a growing denomination. Is it a huge denomination? No, but it is a growing denomination. In the community where I live in the Woodlands, there's the Episcopal Church, and not very far down the street, they're on the same street, interestingly enough, there's an Anglican Church of North America, and they're both about the same size. Uh, so it's a growing movement. Uh, and so we, we wanted to learn from Clark. And, uh, <clears throat> and so he said, yeah, you know, uh, Carmen is right, though. You don't want to be caught off guard. You want to be prepared because the last thing you want to have happen is churches who are who, a bunch of people who say, wow, I can't go that direction anymore, but I would like to go someplace else and there be no place else. And then everybody just splinters and goes off by themselves. I've never had a problem. And I know many of you, I know my brother Rick doesn't. We, we call it connection. I've never had problems with the connection. We, we call ourselves a connectional church. Never had any problems with that. Matter of fact, love it. Think it's great. When it's working healthily, it's a beautiful thing. It allows us to pool resources together and accomplish great things here in the United States and around the, the world, okay? So connection is great, and we want that. But if there's nothing to go to, when the crisis comes, people will just say, well, there's nothing to be a part of, and off they go, okay? So we really took that under advisement at, uh, at Good News. And then another piece of the puzzle fell in place in April of 2015, uh, a body called the Connectional Table of the United Methodist Church. They meet twice a year. A lot of people don't know much about the Connectional Table of the United Methodist Church. It is the highest administrative body of the church between the two general conferences, actually. Uh, there's 45 members of the Connectional Table from all around the world, representatives from every jurisdiction. We have five jurisdictions here in the United States. Uh, they're on the Connectional Table. Uh, and a number of bishops, about 13 bishops, serve on the Connectional Table. And a chair, the chair of the Connectional Table is always a bishop. And so in 2015, they got together in April 2015, they'd been exploring a plan for a long time, and they wanted, they, they kind of took a, the challenge on themselves. They knew that this crisis was growing and growing over our sexual ethics, et cetera, and said, let's try and come up as the connectional table with a solution to solve this problem. And, and, and their solution, their, the name of their plan that they came up with was called A Third Way. And they decided that the best way to resolve the problem is what we in the Good News Movement, Confessing Movement, and other organizations refer to as a local option. Not, not pejoratively, we just think it's a good description, and I'll tell you why here, it'll become evident. The, the connectional sub table said, let's do this. We've got a church that is just so divided over these issues. Why don't we do this? Why don't we tweak, tweak the definition of marriage a little bit in our social principles of the teachings of our church. 
And we'll say, we'll say this, we'll say, we, we, we already say that we believe that marriage is between one man and one woman. Let's just tweak it a little bit and say, traditionally, we believed that marriage was between one man and one woman, but we also now recognize that marriage can be, be between two people, okay? Sounds rather innocuous, but that was the proposal, one piece of the proposal that they were going to make to the general conference. They're putting this plan together as the connectional table, so that's one piece of it. The second piece was they said, you know what, clergy, when they're ordained, they get ordained in their annual conferences. They don't get ordained at a big general conference. It's the annual conference that ordains our clergy. Why don't we just leave it up to every annual conference to decide whether they want to ordain openly self-avowed practicing homosexuals? So if one annual conference says, yeah, we'd like to do that, well, they'd be entitled to do that. If another conference says, no, we can't do that, they would be entitled to do that, okay? So sounds very fair. Uh, and then the, the third piece of it was, is that let's leave it up to clergy, each individual clergy person, whether he or she wants to preside at a same-sex service. We, if, if you don't want to, Walter, that's fine. Uh, if pastor a few miles down at another local United Methodist Church wants to preside at a same-sex service, that's fine too, okay? So you see why we refer to it as a local option, is really sort of devolving the question to local folks, okay, all the way down to just a, a pastor. Um, and while it sounds reasonable, it's got some serious problems, and here I'm going to meddle a little bit and critique the plan for you <laughs> uh, and real fast. Um, this, this is very problematic. We're not talking about um, the design of your church, okay, what, what your building's going to look like. Well, that, that we pretty much all said, we, we can be, well, we like a local option with how church is like. We're, gonna, we're not going to make Asbury Church make it look just like another United Methodist Church in Wichita. We're going to allow some latitude. There are some core things that we don't allow any latitude on in the United Methodist Church, a good number of things. We decided some years ago that women could be just as effective as clergy in the church as men any day of the week. And therefore, we were going to ordain them. That's not up for a local option. We're never going to let, it's just never going to happen in the United Methodist Church as it's currently constituted. It's never going to happen that we say, no, we think we got that one wrong, but maybe we didn't get it completely wrong. Hey, if some annual conferences want to ordain women, that's fine. If some of you don't, that's fine too. I, I can't be a part of a church that would make that kind of move. There are some things that we just can't let allow happen to be a local option. You just kind of get to choose, okay? Some things are core to who we are. The issue of marriage, who, who, who you can marry in a church. The institution of marriage is not only a, an incredible institution in the life of the church, it's an incredible institution a most across almost all religious faiths around the world and has been a principal core institution within the life of the church since its inception, okay? It, it's not a, a, a debate over the color of the church carpet. This is a fundamental issue. We have teachings in scripture and through the, the history of the church on, on marriage. And it would just be chaos in a local community. I, I, I've been here in Wichita, and I know, just driving around, I've seen other United Methodist churches, and they're not very far from here. My guess is some of the young people of this church go to high school with some of the kids in other United Methodist churches. Can you imagine what it's like when they get together and have a conversation already in a, in a culture that is very confused and, and teaches terrible things we know about sexual ethics. Can you imagine two United Methodist young people having a conversation? Well, my, my pastor teaches that, that uh, marriage is between one man and, and, and one woman, and, and that, that I'm to be faithful in that marriage. Um, that's, 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 and, and, and my sexual life can only happen within that context. And the other, you know, United Methodist from the other church, oh, well, my pastor, we celebrate 
same-sex weddings. It's great. Uh, we think it's wonderful. And, and so you can see what kind of um, uh, message, it would be a very confused message that we're sending to the wider culture around us on a fundamental question, okay? So it, it, marriage just simply isn't like some other issues where you can have a local option. We have to have unity around an issue like this, especially something that is grounded in God's word and the teachings of the, of the church. So I digress. Um, but uh, so, so we, we at, uh, at Good News knew that this issue is coming to a head. Here the, the connectional table is going to present this plan to the 2016 General Conference. And now, believe me, uh, as, I, as I explained earlier, every General Conference, there has always been a large, fairly large, uh, group in the church who wants to overturn our teachings on marriage, our sexual ethics, and ordination standards. And, and, and they've been groups kind of like Good News, only on the progressive side, that have, they're called caucus groups, they caucus together and they come and try and change the teachings every time. We know that they're entitled to do that. But here, this time, in April of 2015, just one year before the General Conference, the highest administrative body of the church, by a vote of more than two to one of the members of the connectional table, proposed that plan to the 2016 General Conference. And that concerned us a great deal of good news. We weren't sure that there would be the votes among the General Conference delegates to resist that kind of pressure from leaders in the church to change our church's teachings. And learning from our f folks from the Presbyterian Church, Episcopal Church, and others who said, you, that's the kind of thing you better be ready for. And then a great leader, and I referred to his name earlier, Maxie Dunham, who's been around the church and been a general conference delegate many, many times. Maxie just said, some of us got to get to work and at least we got to have in our back pocket because if that plan that the connectional table is proposing gets passed and all it needed was 51% of the vote at General Conference, if it gets planned, Orthodox evangelicals who can't walk down that road will be expecting us, good news and leaders of other organizations, to literally have a press conference the next day and trying to ex explain to a good portion of the church what we're going to do about it. And so that's the whole genesis of how the Wesley Covenant Association came about. We kind of deputized ourselves to start creating some bylaws and uh, some, some very outlined, uh, we didn't want to go in a lot of detail, but we wanted to be prepared if that happened at General Conference. Now fortunately at General Conference, the delegates didn't change it. Matter of fact, all the legislation to change it got tabled, and we just kind of, you know, wiped our brows and breathed a huge sigh of relief that we didn't have to, to roll that out. We were going to call it the Wesley Covenant Association. We didn't want to call it a church because we don't know where it would go. It's not our place to create a new church, but we wanted an association where people, churches, and individuals could go to to see if they wanted to create a new church, if, if that came to pass. So I'm serious. We were like delighted that, that nothing changed and we didn't have to do that. We knew it would be a big thing. And so we just put it on the shelf, to be quite honest. But then things started happening, and I, and I explained them to you earlier, right after General Conference. The, unfortunately, the, the debate didn't die down. The crisis just got worse. And so a number of leading pastors and lay people across the connection were calling us and saying, you know, we better start moving this Wesley Covenant Association thing ahead, even though the bad thing didn't happen. We need to be prepared, especially if there's going to be this called General Conference. And so we had our inaugural event in Chicago, the Wesley Covenant Association did, in uh, October of 2016. And um, I was charged with trying to find a venue and the agenda for how the conference, recruiting speakers and all of this. And here we started this, I remember it was the last week of June, to try and get ready for this conference and, and create a, a whole new organization. We wanted the organization to be within the context of the United Methodist Church. And so, um, so I, I remember calling around, trying to find, we just wanted a one-day conference uh, so people didn't have to spend a lot of money. We didn't want, we wanted to try and keep 
as many people as possible from having to ha have to get a hotel room as possible. And, uh, and I remember calling around to venues, and I, we, were, we were trying to look to a, a venue that's close to an airport so people from all over the place could get in, get out as quickly as possible. And I remember getting on the phone and starting to call venues in Atlanta, all the kind of normal places, and maybe Nashville, maybe uh, New York, or you know, whatever. And, uh, and I would say, you know, uh, I don't know how many people would come to this event. Uh, you know, um, we've never done one before. We'd like to rent some space in your venue. Well, when would you like to the space? Well, in, in October, you, or in, this is October of 2016. You mean October 2019 or 2020? <laughs> No, no, I mean October of this year. And some of them would just say, you don't know what you're talking about, which pretty much was true. Uh, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, but, but incredibly enough, uh, there's a large convention center, I forget the name of it now, uh, right near O'Hare Airport in Chicago. And they said, you know what, we're booked Monday through Thursday. And then we got a big conference coming in called the Comic-Con. I think it's a big comic book. <laughs> coming in on Saturday and Sunday. They said, but we have Friday free. Uh, so if you could, you know, shoehorn your thing in then, the, you know, you're welcome to, to come and use the space. And, and so they said, how many people you have coming? Well, I don't really know. Uh, <laughs> you know they, they must think this guy is a, we, we're not sure. Even if he's got the money, we don't know that we really want to get, uh, allow, allow him to do this because he seems very confused. Um, but nevertheless, flew up to Chicago, good colleague of mine, a pastor in, in, in Chicago. We went and looked at the venue and a uh, huge room, huge room, could have, held 2,500 people. I said, well, I'm confident we're not going to need, we, we may need a quarter of this room. I can't imagine any more than 500 people coming. Okay, that would be great. We would have been thrilled to have 500 people come to Chicago for this one day meeting to launch this association called Wesley Covenant Association. So we go back home and feverishly working to get a website up so that people can register to come to the conference. I was had a target date of August 1 to allow people to register to, to learn about the Wesley Covenant Association and come. We couldn't get it up. Oh, struggle, struggle, struggle. Finally get the registration form up on August 8th. Uh, and, you know, literally we're now just two months from the conference and we're just now letting people register. And so now we're thinking, boy, we're probably not even going to get 500. But we turned the website on and within a week we had 500 people registered. Pastors and lay people worried about the church and wanting to be a part of something. See, that shows you how powerful connection is. People want to be a part of connection. They want to be connected together. And so it just kept growing. So I'd have to get back on the phone at the end of almost every week to the folks in Chicago and said, you know, I know I said I only wanted this much of the space. Can I get any more? Well, we're not gonna, don't worry, we're not gonna rent any more of it out because we don't like having two conferences in the same room because we have to pull these air walls out. So we can't, you know, you're, you, you've got it. And so call back, call back every week. And the last time I called them, when we closed registration, I said, I've got 1,742 people who have registered to come to this event, to the inaugural Wesley Covenant Association. So they said, well, fortunately, we can still shoehorn you in. Uh, we were going to set up lunch for everybody, and everybody would have been able to sit at a table, but now you've taken up so much of the space, some of the people are just going to have to sit on the floor or somewhere in the, and those of you who were there maybe did sit on the floor. And uh, there you go. Uh, Rick's a good friend, but I couldn't get him a chair. I have other good friends, but, you know. but um, so anyway, it was just incredible. When we get there that day, People who know stuff about conferences said, you know, if you've got 1,700 something registered, you can count on some people not making it. Something will come up and they won't be, so you'll probably get 1,650 will, will show up. And we get there and literally they are having to go find chairs and trolley them in so that we can find. We ended up with over 1,800. I, to be honest, I don't know how many were there, but the, the, the gentleman who ran the, the facility there said, well, I know it was over 1,800 people because I set them up X amount of chairs and I brought in X amount more and we set people and we still had people sitting in the wall. And finally he said, you have to tell your ushers that if any more come, they can't come in because we've got it already arranged and the fire marshal will give us trouble. So that's, the Wesley Covenant Association was started then, right there. 
80% of those who attended were pastors, 20% were lay people, not surprising, lay people, many of you work hard all through the week and just can't, you know, up and say, I'm going to fly up to Chicago and go to a conference for a day. Um, and so it was just incredible. It showed the passion that people had for wanting to remain connected and, and, and wanting to uphold core doctrines of the United Methodist Church. You can go to our website. Everything the Wesley Covenant Association asks you to endorse if you want to become a member is out of the United Methodist Church Book of Discipline. We don't ask you to sign on to anything, anything in opposition to the United Methodist Church. We stand solidly for the core life-giving doctrines and teachings of the United Methodist Church, solidly behind them, and always will. We stand for connection. We want a healthy and whole church. We don't want to see the church divide. But if it is going to divide, if that is what happened, if, if a group wants to walk one way and people of good conscience can't walk that way with them and want to walk a different way, then we want to be there so that we can still have a connection. So we're praying fervently and working fervently that we remain united, but it would be, um, it would be irresponsible of some leaders in the United Methodist Church not to face reality and say, whether we like it or not, there is the potential for division in the church. The Council of Bishops knows that. The General Conference knows that. Everybody in leadership in the United Methodist Church knows that this is a possibility. So that we are preparing for that eventuality should not surprise anyone or upset them. We're not trying to divide the church but doggone it, we're going to be ready if it comes to that, okay? So we have to be prepared. So that's how the Wesley Covenant Association has come into existence. We have a number of things that we stand for, but again, all in conformity with the teachings of the United Methodist Church. Right now, many of you are aware that um, there are three plans on the table. I'm not even going to go into them. Somebody may have a question, and I'll go into them if, if you need me to. But... Um, uh, we at the Wesley Covenant Association are fully aware of all three of those plans. And so some time ago when we knew that there were three plans, way back in the fall of last year when we knew that three plans were being discussed by the Commission on a Way Forward, we immediately at our fall meeting last year created three task groups. And each task group is assigned with coming up with a detailed white paper on how we at the Wesley Covenant would respond if that option was, was passed at the General Conference, okay? And we even created another task force because unfortunately there's a fourth possibility that could happen at the called General Conference. It's a very dire one and we hope it doesn't come to this, but unfortunately it is a real possibility. And that is, is that the General Conference delegates can't come to any decision, that no plan can get a majority. And then we will have spent approximately five to seven million dollars on the General Conference, the Commission on a Way Forward, special meetings of the Council of Bishops, special meeting of our Judicial Council, spent all of this money and will have got nothing at the end of it. That's, I hate to say it, that's a possibility. I, I give that possibility about a 49% chance of happening, that we, don't, we, we come out of general conference with nothing. I think they'll come up with a plan. I give them a 51% chance of doing it because they all know that if they don't, I'm not saying the plan they come up with might, might be a good, it might, not, it might be a bad plan, but I think they'll get a plan because it would just be a disaster to have spent all that money and we all walk away from St. Louis, which is where the general conference will be, uh, with nothing, okay? Um, so, so we're ready. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail of those plans. We get charged with being divisive and schismatic for simply preparing for what might possibly happen. People, well, told you, see, Wesley, the covenant, they're already planning for, to do this or that. Well, of course we are. Of course we are. But for some reason, you get charged as being schismatic for, for planning for very, very potential realities. Again, we would be irresponsible if someone wasn't doing that. So that's one thing that, that we're doing right now at the Wesley Covenant Association. We're trying to start Wesley Covenant Association chapters in, in every annual conference. So if it comes to it, we're ready to stand things up. We already have 25 
annual conferences that have West, Wesley Covenant Association chapters. We have five to ten more that are in the process of becoming chapters. And so we're encouraging that and folks are coming right along. This is literally a grassroots movement. I want to remind you that. Uh, when the organization formed in Chicago, they, they hired a search firm to find a president. They wanted to find a good president and uh, they hired a great one, Reverend Keith Boyette. He's actually been one of the uh, members of the Judicial Council, served on the church's Supreme Court, uh, was an attorney before he came into the ministry, very successful minister, planted a church in Virginia, served it for 19 years. He'd still be there today had not the Wesley Covenant Association asked him to be the president of the organization. And so he comes with a wealth of knowledge, a wealth of experience in the United Methodist Church, passionate about the United Methodist Church, was raised since he was a little boy in the United Methodist Church. So he's just the kind of guy you want to have lead the Wesley Covenant Association. And so, uh, so we really, this, this is such a grassroots movement that we didn't get our president until the middle of July last year. For a while, he was the only employee of the Wesley Covenant Association. He hired a tremendous executive assistant by the name of Teresa Marcus. She does so much work. And then I came on in the middle of October, and we have been traveling around the country. We've been in, I think, somewhere between 12 and 15 annual conferences since January, doing just these kind of events that Rick helped plan here visiting tons of United Methodists, tons of laity who are becoming aware that, wow, this could, infect my, this could affect my local church and I want to know what's going on. And so it's, it's a very quickly growing, rapidly uh, growing movement within the United Methodist Church, the Wesley Covenant Association is. And so we will be ready on the other side of the special called Convene General Conference. We don't have general conferences that are special called very often. We've only had one other one, and that was just to kind of tidy up some things when we became the United Methodist Church way back in the late 60s, early 70s. So this is truly an unprecedented time that we are in, and the Wesley Covenant will be able easily on the other side of the, of the conference to uh, say how we will respond based on what the General Conference decides, okay? I want you to be assured of that. So. That's a primer <laughs> on the Wesley Covenant Association, how we got where we are today. Uh, if you have any questions, specific questions about the Wesley Covenant Association or the plans that are being mooted around the church right now, that the Council, the council of Bishops literally is, is having a meeting that will convene, I think, Sunday or Monday this weekend. Uh, and they will be meeting for four days. And we will be very interested to what they say after they finish uh, that, that meeting. And then there's a special called meeting of a, of a judicial council meeting to, to take up a, a case that is, pertains to all of these matters. And they'll be meeting on May the 24th. So a lot of developments will happen here in, in May in the life of the United Methodist Church. And we can get into those if that's where you want to go. If it's not where you want to go, that's fine. So I'm going to turn it over. Susan, thank you so much, Susan, for helping. I'm going to turn it over to questions. Hey, Walter, uh, right will you define those terms real quick, though, again? The, the evangelical orthodox terms? Okay, okay. okay. Just quickly. Yeah. Very quickly. Uh, when I Evangelical. Matter of fact, Rob and I's book, we were happy to, to take the term. They, they, they called and said, would you be willing to represent the evangelicals? Uh, <laughs> Sure, we'd be happy to represent. And I get why they ask it that way. They, they even wanted to know if we'd be willing to put the word evangelical on the book. Uh, and be, that's because, you know, in fairness to them, they know that even some evangelicals in our culture today don't like referring to themselves as evangelical anymore. Unfortunately, the term has kind of got hijacked into the national politics, and now many good evangelical people are reticent to even describe themselves as evangelical because they think unchurched people then pigeonhole them and think they're this kind of person because they call themselves an evangelical. And that's very unfortunate. Uh, I, I just take it as a challenge. It just means I have to work all the harder to help people understand what the, what the word really means. And it's a New Testament word, of course. It's from the Greek word, euangelion, which means the good news. And we all know who the good news is. It's Jesus. It's not some political figure or anybody. It's Jesus is the good news. And, uh, and our job is to go and tell people the good news of Jesus Christ. And so I'm happy to be an, an evangelical. And that's all we mean when we use the phrase 
evangelical, okay? Orthodox is a term that many people in the church, particularly clergy, have been using to describe themselves. Some of them as a replacement for the term evangelical, some as an additional inter, uh, identifier. <clears throat> and orthodox is another one of those great words from, from the Greek language. It makes me think of my big fat Greek wedding, you know, everything is, you, know, um, you get a little Windex out. And so um, uh, orthodox simply means right believing, okay, right believing. And, uh, and, and it's a term that the church has, that not just the United Methodist Church, but the church universal has used for centuries, many centuries. And, it's, and we, we, we just, we have some core, core doctrinal teachings. One of our core doctrinal teachings is the toning sacrifice of Jesus Christ on, on the cross. That's another one that's not up for a local option. If you're going to be a United Methodist, you don't get to decide, well, uh, you know, maybe, maybe not. Uh, I, I'm going to take the local option on that one and say uh, not, not so much. Uh, no, it's core to who we are. And if you want to be a part of this, you have to confess that doctrine. And it's, it's an orthodox doctrine. It's, it's, it's right believing to believe that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior because of his atoning sacrifice on the cross. So, so a lot of us use that term to, to describe who we are. And then, of course, the, the term conservative we're not trying to identify with any political party. That has nothing to do with how the term is used in the church. The term is, is used in the church is just from the, the, the word conservative, is really from the, 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 the root word conserve. We're simply trying to conserve some things that we think are core to who we are. We're very open to change. I mean, just think about how much the church has changed over the past 50 years. My guess, and this is no indictment or no criticism at all, my guess is 50 years ago, the worship experience in this local church would have been different than it is now. And that's okay. That's okay. Uh, we need to change sometimes. Our goal is to reach out to people and you know, share the good news of Jesus Christ. And we have to update that for our time and place. And that's, and that's fair. Uh, but some things we have to conserve. They're so important, they're not up for change. And so that's what I mean when I use those, those terms, conservative, orthodox, evangelical. Okay? So Susan's going to turn it over, and I think we got one question right here immediately. Questions, not speeches. Steve Morgan, uh, clergy. Mm -hmm. Are any of the uh, plans being developed consistent with the beliefs and values of the WCA? Thank you very much. And that's being the three plans as quickly as I can. I know some people aren't even aware there are three plans, and that's totally legitimate. Um, but so we're all on the same page. Let me just clarify the, the plans as quickly as I possibly can. The, the, the commission is the one that, that has produced these, these plans, and they're producing them for the Council of Bishops. It was the hope that the commission would, would come up with maybe one or two They'd give the, the plans, they had fully, more or less fully fleshed them out. They'd give them to the Council of Bishops. The Council of Bishops would look at them, maybe choose one. Frankly, that was the hope that the, the council as a, as a, as a, would gain consensus, that most of the bishops would gain consensus around one plan so that they would present to the special called General Conference just one plan to consider. But not surprisingly, this should not surprise us at all, the, the, the commission, the, the individuals that the bishops selected to be on the commission, they're representative of the United Methodist Church. Guess what? After meeting for a year in a number of face-to-face -face meetings, United Methodists from all around the world, they decided they couldn't come up with one plan. They couldn't gain consensus. One, they couldn't gain consensus around two plans. So they offered three plans. And so the first plan is essentially a plan that I think most conservatives would be in support of. And it would reaffirm, it would strongly reaffirm our sexual ethics, teachings on marriage and ordination standards. But it would add some additional accountability measures that would make it difficult, or hopefully make it difficult, for clergy and bishops to violate the discipline without consequence, because that is going on, unfortunately, on a fairly regular basis in the United Methodist Church right now, okay? Uh, so that's in broad outline. There's more detail to it, but in broad outline for right now, that's plan one. Plan two was, is essentially that local option I talked to you about earlier. That's another plan. 
the, 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 the bishops call it the one church model. By the way, that's not a plan that the most ardent progressives like, okay? They don't like that plan. And a matter of fact, some of the most ardent lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgendered, queer caucus folks, and I need to stop here. When I grew up, using the term queer uh, was a mean-spirited word to use. And I had, you know, for many, many years, that's a word I didn't use, okay? I just didn't use that. But uh, the folks in that community now, they're, they're actually adopting that word. It's kind of like a badge. We're, we're, if that's what people call us, we're going to be that. And so now you have new groups forming in the, ch in the church. There's a number of clergy, United Methodist clergy in the church, who've created a new group, and, and they just simply call themselves the Queer Clergy Caucus. So I, I'm not using that term pejoratively. That's a term that they have adopted, okay? Uh, and so they really don't like that second option. They, they, call, they, they don't call the plan the, the local option. They call it the Jim Crow option. Because for them, and you have to see it, they're social justice warriors. They, they want to convert the likes of me to see what is really true, truly justice for LGBTQ people. And so they, they have no intention of leaving, by the way, the United Methodist Church. Their goal is to change us. And, and you have to at least tip your hat to them for their perseverance their, their not, and their dedication to their cause, okay? So they look at this plan and some of the centrists who propose the plan are kind of shocked at how harshly the plan gets critiqued by these progressives. I, I've heard some of they, they have some great rhetoricians, great, and I mean that in a good way. They, they are just really good speechifiers. And, and I, I heard one, uh, one member of that caucus say, you know, it would be akin, that plan is akin to, to like President Johnson back in the 1970s calling Martin Luther King to the White House and saying, hey, Martin, man, I'm really with you. I think your, your, your battle for civil rights for African Americans is right on. But, you know, some people in some states aren't so big on it. Why don't we work out a, a fair plan? Wouldn't it be fair if we allowed people in some states to go ahead and discriminate? They, they've been doing it a long time. And, you know, let's let them discriminate against African Americans in some states. But in some states, we'll say we're not going to do that any longer. And so those states that are willing to say we're not going to discriminate anymore, that's fine for them. But those, of th those that want to, well, they can continue discriminating. That's a, that's a fair local option, isn't it? Well, the, 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 the folks on the left in the United Methodist Church say, that's a, that's a Jim Crow plan. Nobody would have ever in their right mind proposed that to Dr. Martin Luther King. And of course, he would have got up and walked right out of the room. And so these folks really do not like that, that second option. And then finally, there's a third option. And it's called the multi-branch option. It's, I'll just be honest, it's convoluted, and it'll take me a second to explain it. It would, it would leave in existence something that might be called the United Methodist Communion. To kind of think of it a big umbrella. I'm going to mix the metaphors here in a second because you just have to. So you'd, you'd have a United Methodist Communion, and underneath that, uh, there would be some things that we maybe all could say were okay with existing uh, for everybody. So you'd have the same, you'd, you'd still have a council of bishops of the whole communion. Our, our current bishops would still be the bishops of the whole communion. Uh, all, everybody likes the United Methodist Committee on Relief. It does great work. Anytime, we had a terrible hurricane down in Texas, and we were very thankful that United Methodists all around the country immediately started giving to UMCOR, and it really helped all through the Gulf area of Texas to recover from, from the hurricane. We're still getting money uh, from, from the church for that, and very thankful for it. It's like one of the great things about connectionalism. And then there's, there's uh, pastors are very thankful for our general board of health and um, uh, pension benefits, which is now called Westpath. And we all appreciate that there's some group, general church, where all the funds are going, they're investing it so that we can have pensions when we, we retire. So we'd leave that in existence too, maybe. And maybe a 
a couple other things. But then below that, there would be, and here I'm going to mix the metaphors, you'd have silos underneath the big umbrella. One silo would be for people like me, who describe themselves as conservative orthodox evangelicals, and because of their commitment to certain doctrines, core fundamental doctrines of the church, believe a certain way about our sexual ethics and teachings on marriage and ordination standards. And we could all be over there in that silo. In the middle, could be those people who are like, well, you know, we're going to leave it up to whoever, do what's best in your own eyes, and you can be a part of our church silo in the middle. And over here could be those uh, folks who are ardently for full inclusive rights of all LGBTQ people, and they could live in a silo. So we'd all fall under the umbrella, but we'd all be separated. In, in a way too. And we wouldn't have to co-mingle our funds and support things that we couldn't in good conscience support. Again, a, a, a plan on paper that sounds, I'm going to stop there, I'm not going to critique the plan. You ask, is there a conservative plan? So there are all three of the plans. The plan one is the conservative one. Okay. Anybody else with a question? Why don't progressives, if they don't like the church's teachings, and after time and time again of, getting, of trying to get the church to change its teachings, why don't they just go off and form their own denomination? And a matter of fact, back in the 1990s, behind the scenes, the Good News Movement, leaders of the Good News Movement, reached out to some of those very progressives, brought in some centrists too, and said, hey, if they would like to leave, we, we would we would be supportive of that and, and we wouldn't want to be um, punitive in their leaving. In other words, we wouldn't want to enforce the trust clause, we wouldn't want to enforce, we wouldn't want to say that, well, liberals, if you're leaving, fine, uh, but you can't take your church property with you. You know that's all held in trust to your annual conference, so all of your property and assets st have to stay behind. So you can leave, but that's we're going to enforce the trust fund. No, there was work that was trying to be done to say, if you want to leave, you can take all that. We're not, we're not going to try and get that from you. Matter of fact, we, knew there, we even knew in the early 90s that there were whole annual conferences that wanted to walk that progressive way. And it was made very clear that the conservatives would work hard to say, if the whole annual conference wants to go, we would, have them, we, we would want them to take all of their property and assets. We don't want to get in a court battle, in a civil court battle, with brothers and sisters, even though we have a fundamental disagreement. But see, you have to understand that, um, that these, these folks, uh, in fairness to them, uh, I, I get why sometimes we interpret it as a power grab, okay? And in some ways, of course, it is. But you, you have to take them at their word. They truly, honestly believe that, Walter, you are wrong on the church's sexual ethics. Walter, you are wrong about the teachings on marriage, and you are wrong about the ordination <laughs> issue. And, Walter, we, we want two things to happen for you. Either for you to see the light and change your mind, or go elsewhere and find another church, okay? That, and, and, and I don't say that in a mean-spirited way. And some of them, by the way, don't say it in a mean-spirited way to me either. But that's their goal. Their goal isn't to create a new church. Their goal is to reform and change the United Methodist Church. So it would be antithetical to their cause to leave the United Methodist Church, okay? Another, another question? Discipline. Um, there's some concern that 
the options two and three will really be the only ones presented because if neither one of those are able to pass, then maybe kind of by default, we would go or we would remain with them. Is that a concern uh, with, uh, with the, the yeah. with the Code Association or, or is that some unfounded concern? No, it's concern and, and the bishops, they themselves created the, the majority. You know, you, you have to remember that the, the council uh, likes to to project consensus to the wider church. They don't like to project to the church that they're disunified, okay? So they work very hard to, to, to portray that they are unified. And, and so kind of, it was a, a, an issue of messaging. They, they had a special meeting in late February, just this past February, and they were looking at all three of the plans, and it actually leaked out a retired liberal bishop um, kind of spilled the beans and said, you know, we're actually kind of voting on the plans. <laughs> Which, uh, frankly, I was relieved that they were. I mean, it's getting late in the game. They gotta, they have to, by, by the disciplinary standards, they have to let delegates like Dixie know sometime in the summer what's going to be on the table. You, they, they can't surprise Dixie at General Conference and the rest of the del delegates and say, hey, we're going to let you know what the plan is now. And, you know, they, they need, they only got three and a half days in St. Louis. So they need, to, the whole church needs to know what the plan is they're proposing months ahead of time. And so I was glad that they were doing voting. I wish they would have just been candid with all of us and said, yeah, we're actually sitting in here voting on which plan the majority of us like. And, and a liberal bishop lets slip that, that when it just the active bishops voted, and only active bishops do get to vote, retired bishops can go to the council of bishop meeting, they have voice, but they can't vote. So when they were taking votes, they discovered that about 55% of them were behind that plan too, okay? Some were interested in plan three, not so much behind plan one. And so they told uh, the commission on a way forward after they finished their meetings, we'd like you to do some more work fleshing out particularly plan two and maybe a little more work on plan three. So when the, by saying that, they gave the impression to the whole church that they weren't even interested in plan one anymore. And so a lot of conservatives, ourselves included, began to, at the WCA, Good News, Confessing Movement, UM Action, began to push back quietly against some bishop, well not so quietly, actually we wrote articles about it and published them. Uh, and we began to push back and, and lo and behold, within the past month, the current president of the Council of Bishops, who will be stepping down shortly, actually during this Council of Bishops meeting in the next week, uh, the present president, uh, present president of the Council of Bishops, Bruce O, in the last month said, oh, whoa, 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 whoa. We, we, we probably shouldn't have said what we said because we gave the impression that we're not interested at all in option one. That's the, the impression people walk with. He, and so he wanted to make clear that that's that's still on the table. It's still a topic of conversation, and those bishops who are supportive of it are definitely going to bring it up when we get together next, this coming week. Uh, and, and so is the other plan, for, for that matter. And uh, the incoming council, the president of the Council of Bishops, Ken Carter from the Florida Annual Conference, who's actually one of the presiding bishops, there are three presiding bishops on the Commission on a Way Forward, he also said, I, I want to assure people that Plan 1 is still on the table. So as far as we know, what's being communicated to us by the Council of Bishops is that they're all three still on the table, okay? So in, in point of fact, this is how divided and how fluid and dynamic the situation is right now. I don't think you could get one bishop to tell you right now what they think is going to happen this coming week and what they'll come out and say after they finish their meetings. They just don't know. And, and hopefully they'll know by the end of the week because we gotta have some plan to, to, to start to debate when we, when we um, get ready to, for the call gen, general conference. So that's kind of where that's at right now. And, and just let me kind of finish the thought because uh, I think this is what you were going at too. If for instance, the bishops, the majority continue to, to, to form consensus, we're told about 55% of the bishops are, are for that plan to that local option. If that were the case, you can be assured that the Good News Movement, uh, UM Action, um, Confessing Movement, they will work very hard to make sure that some way, somehow, 
that first option is a viable option that's on the table. And if it does get to general conference, it's got just as good a chance as any other of getting passed. I'm quite sure of that. It, some people would say it's probably got the better chance. Okay. You said uh, 25 conferences have WCAs. Mm -hmm. How many conferences are there in the United States? Uh, there are 56 in the United States uh, right now. And what date is it's uh, February, Dixie, help me with this, February 24th through 20, 23rd through 26th. Mm -hmm. Yes. In St. Louis, Missouri, by the way. I just want to reiterate that. Yeah. I just wanted to know, just real quick, you keep this weekend, and then we've got annual conferences, and then we've got delegates meet, or delegates all meet How many times do the bishops me, can they keep changing their minds I've and then letting the delegates know again? Like, like how many times can okay. all this go yeah. round and round and round? That's a great question. It's, kind of, it's actually kind of in some ways a polity question. Uh, the, the Council of Bishops schedules two regular meetings every year. They have one spring meeting. They tend to, 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 to meet in late April, early May, once a year. And then they meet in the fall, late October, early November. Because of the crisis we're in, they had a, an additional meeting in late February. And, and uh, it, it's, they'd probably meet more often. It's just incredibly expensive. I mean, it's really, my guess is they're spending over $500,000 every time they get together. And I say that because we fly, you know, all of the bishops wherever they're at. And sometimes our Council of Bishops meets in Germany or somewhere in Africa or in the Philippines, okay? And so you're flying lots of people all over the place. They, and it's just not the council who goes. Some of their staff goes with them. The, the council, of course, has a staff that works for them. And then they've got, you know, hotel rooms that they got to book. They've got meeting rooms, all kinds of resources that go into having a meeting. You just can imagine if you're a, a bishop in the Congo, in North Katanga, and the, the bishops, they're meeting in, I think, uh, is it Chicago? I'm pretty sure, yeah, they're meeting in Chicago starting tomorrow. Well, it might take you three flights to get to Chicago from the Congo. So it, these are ex very, very expensive endeavors. So they just typically meet twice. So, and when they do, to get real to the nub of your question, I, am, I highly doubt if they, if they reach a conclusion uh, at the end of this meeting, the likelihood that they will change it is not high. And a matter of fact, by discipline, there's a point in which they can't change it. They literally have to have their plan in what is called legislative form. So they have to show every delegate, this is the line I'd like to strike out of the discipline to make this plan implemented. Here's the words that would be added to the discipline. And that's gonna be a huge task, particularly if, if, if for some reason they rallied around plan three. Plan three would require a number of constitutional amendments. And that really lengthened the process. So they've got to have all of that ready, and they've got to have it translated into about seven to 10 different languages. Because some people, some of our global delegates, they don't, they don't speak English. And, and, and so and they, they've got to have that out to every, they've got to have it to the, to the Commission on General Conference no later than July 8th. So the, 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 the plan has to be in legislative form no later than July 8th then the Commission on Regional Conference will get it translated and send it out to all of the delegates. And by that point, it, it, it is also public knowledge to every member of the United Methodist Church. <clears throat> the plan has, has, to be, has to be ready to go. Yep. Okay, so, so then we should know what they think. Sometime after July 8th, we will definitively know. We're told, and I, I just, just we're told quietly, some bishops say that, um, that after this meeting that they're having literally this week, that maybe four or five days afterwards, they'll say, here's where we are. We don't have the plan in legislative form, but we can tell you what we're going to be proposing. I think that would be really good because you, many of you know, we're coming upon what's called annual conference season in the United Methodist Church. All of our annual conferences, all 56 of them, will have an annual conference sometime in May or June. And I think it'd be healthy for the church to begin to, to talk about these issues at a more grassroots level. So hopefully they'll do that, but there's no assurance. They don't have to, let's put it that way. You mentioned that there are about 35% of 
United Methodists are African. I just wonder to what degree is the WCA able to have some conversations with Africa, African United Methodists about these issues? Do you have very many members that aren't Africans? Yeah, great, great question. Uh, uh, earlier I was saying that somewhere between 30 and 35 percent of the general conference delegates are from Africa. Uh, actually, Africa is growing so fast, the folks at the General Council on Finance and Administration will tell you this, they, they like just incredible growth. And so the actual number of members in Africa they think is somewhere uh, around 40 percent of the whole church. So it's quite possible, friends, that by literally by 2020, in just a couple years, there will be more members of the United Methodist Church in Africa than there are in the United States. It's just simply the world they live in is very different than the world we live in. They don't have access to the, some of the resources we do. Uh, it's you know sometimes we get in our head that. Africa's just one big homogenous, you know, whole continent uh, like the United States. But of course, we always have to remind ourselves it's actually a bunch of nations, yeah. uh, different. And, and so some of them can't even communicate. They do, they do, new, they do no better communicating with one another uh, than we do with them because they speak totally different languages. They do things a little differently. They have different laws in their nations and so forth. And so they're, they're, they're really uh, challenged, but still, they're growing, 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 growing. And, um, and so, yeah, they're, they're going to be with us. So to get to your question, um, yes, uh, we have three very well thought of, um, widely known African leaders, not just in their own annual conference, not just in their own country, but are known widely uh, around the, uh, the, the continent of Africa. All three of them happen to be pastors, uh, and they are members of our WCA council, participate regularly, write for us, um, and, and so they're on our council, and we're starting to get a number of, of members. We do have members who join in Africa. Um, they, we, we charge uh, on a sliding scale to generally about $10 for a membership. Uh, for an individual to join in Africa. It's $100 if you want to join as a lay member or a clergy member. If you're a retired clergy, you can join for 50. And if you're going through course of study or seminary, you can join for $25 and become a member of WCA, okay? So yes, we do. And um, a matter of fact, the, the bishops in Africa are very interested about the WCA and uh, are reaching out to us to learn more about it. Uh, you, you could see why they would reach out to an organization like WCA. Many, not all, but many, many, many of our folks in Africa, at least their understanding of our doctrine and our social ethics match where a lot of conservative Orthodox evangelicals in the United Methodist Church are. So we, we, we have some alliances, not on everything, but on, but on a number of things. Well, folks, it's 12.04. I, I, I went past the hour. I'd be more than happy to take questions out of the narthex. If you'd like to buy a book, that's fine, too. I'll be out there for that. I'm going to creep, creep to the back, and I'm going to let my brother uh, Rick uh, close this out. Thank you so much once again for taking the time to come. I really appreciate it. All right. I don't know if this thing's working anymore. I think my batteries are gone. There. Thank you. Okay. Friends, um, we have uh, honestly just scratched the surface. Um, there is, there is a, a lot, lot more. Uh, but here, here's something. Here's the deal. Uh, and I've said this everywhere. Is, uh, Jesus is still on the throne. All right? And we're called to be faithful. Uh, just as faithful as we can be, uh, uh, without being in, in a person's face necessarily or that type of thing, but, but also that we, we stand on the solid rock, who is Jesus, and we stand and uphold uh, the authority of Scripture. We believe in the Lordship of Jesus Christ, and there are some things that are ultimately, uh, in, in essence, uh, not up for debate, where we can debate them, but really not to be compromised. And so we, that's why we hold to some of these things. And uh, we, we try not to do that mean-spirited in any way, and we're accused of that. I get that. I get that all the time. And, and, uh, and yet, uh, you know, at some point, you've got to stand for something. And so we seek to do that. Um, just so you know, 
um, we're seeking to, to form a WCA chapter in, in, in this area and we'll be getting some information from, from Keith Boyette and Dixie. I'll probably be in conversation with you a little bit more. I pray for Dixie. She took a lot of heat back at the jurisdictional conference when she stood up and said, uh, tell me about this decision that you just made with regards to Bishop Oliveto. Is this legal or not? And, uh, you know, so when you, when you take a stand like that, that's pretty tough going. And so, uh, Dixie, we still pray for you, and, but yet we're very thankful for you, so bless your heart. Um, also, uh, you know, we've got some renewal things. We've got a renewal page on Facebook. If you're interested in that, you can see me about that. If you have other questions, uh, you can contact me here at the church or email rick.just. There is a just in this church. There's two right now. There's three. Uh, rick.just at asburychurch.org if you have some questions there and so forth. But we, uh, we really appreciate Walter being with us today. Kevin and Rod, I need your voices up here to help us sing. You'll have to turn these mics on. And because we're going to sing one more song, and the, the words will be up there on the screen, Kevin. But uh, we, we can't close without singing a Wesley song, all right? And there's a song that, that Charles wrote. In fact, there's thousands of songs that Charles wrote. But uh, we're going to stand and sing, And Can It Be?
hands get stuck. I tell you what, that, that, is, that is theology at its best. That is scripture sung. You sing that to someone who knows Jesus. By the end of the fifth verse, they will get saved. I'm telling you, I'm telling you, friends, the good news is called good news because it's good news. Get out of here and go in peace. Amen. Thank you all for coming.